A questo punto inizia la trasmissione. Tutti i partecipanti sono in grado solo di ascoltare. Uh, bonjour à tout le monde, uh, good morning to everybody, and thank you for joining us in this uh, special webinar for Morocco. We will speak in broken English. Uh, même je pourrais parler bien avec mon français exotique, mais internationally we speak broken English. It's a great honor and pleasure to be back in Morocco, even though virtually. Uh, I remind you that 10 years ago, Res for Med, which was the original name of our foundation, started with Morocco. And uh, I still see uh, the company I was a, a friend of. Um, El Afidi at that time was the director general of the ministry and now is in One. Uh, Badrik in, uh, in uh, Irezen. I remember the inauguration of Ben Gerir. Me and Anna were there when the, the king came. 
of course, Akhmed Baroudi from CA. I think uh, I'm looking forward to come back to see my friends, but most important, I'm looking back to provide you added value to the Morocco leadership. And Morocco is important for us because not only since the beginning, has shown leadership in its policy, regulatory, and implementation, but also the leadership in showing this track record to the to the our African continent. So I want to thank my ambassador with, to underline the importance of this first meeting. I, I'm really honored to have um, Amanda Barucco, our ambassador in Italy, who will briefly introduce the friendship approach that we European have with the Morocco. And for, of course, I don't, and the, later on, Anna Rozova will do the, the co coordination. Ambassador, the floor is yours because I don't think I will say much more. Grazie, Ambassador. No, grazie mille, grazie mille, Roberto. Grazie. Thank you very much to you and uh, to all the people who actually collaborated to, to, to have this event. I try to be as brief as possible, but then I think that there are some important things to do because uh, this is uh, this is uh, this uh, this webinar is happening in a very complex uh, moment uh, and uh, in which uh, things are changing very very fast and that uh, some of the pillars of our energy policy have been put again into discussion and i think that uh, morocco and italy are two countries that actually face the same, a lot of similar problems. And uh, for this reason, they can actually work together in this new environment that is extremely complex uh, in, even in the future. So first of all, thanks uh, to Rest for Africa Foundation for organizing this event. And thanks uh, to our Moroccan friends for being here with us and to our Italian friends. And uh, of course, I don't have to say much about Morocco. What I expect is also the contribution coming from our Moroccan friends and experts. So I want to deal too much with the Moroccan uh, renewable energy policy. I would just stress one very important point. You know, as I said, Italy and Morocco have a lot to share. And have a lot to share because there are two countries uh, which have been actually favored by mother nature from many points of view, but of course not from the energy point of view. We don't have, uh, we exhausted our uh, fossil, fossil resources a long time ago. Uh, we have always been dependent by international markets from, uh, from that point of view. And we are usually dependent uh, from uh, energy, from gas and oil coming from uh, foreign sources. So this is one of the reasons because renewable energy and the development of renewable energy has been so important for Italy in the past years. And the same would apply to Morocco. And if I can just quote the Moroccan data, as it refers to the national energy strategy launched in 2009, and then revised again in 2015 and 2016, which aims to reduce the energy dependency rate to 82%. And to achieve this goal, the further development of renewable energies is a priority. And the main point Do you have any problems? I think Italian companies are actually the, the main protagonists, like uh, energy in power in the in the in the wind power and the the, the plants that uh, are being have been built and are being built along the Atlantic coastline. But of course, uh, there is uh, all the opportunities coming from solar power, all the opportunities coming from the hydro like hydro hydraulic power and of course uh, you know the new frontier of uh, hydrogen and green ammonia for which we have a lot of interest coming also from some of the main italian group towards morocco mm -hmm. so this is about morocco and uh, what i would just say but i don't want to repeat things that our moroccan friends know very well uh, you know uh, the, the, 
that in the in the past months we have received several delegations coming from Italian companies. I would say especially related to uh, the development of green hydrogen, and we know very well why uh, Morocco is uh, a favorite spot for developing this technology. First of all, for 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 its geographical location, and then for the energy and logistic infrastructure and then of course the presence of huge phosphate deposits that are actually a plus for producing of green ammonia and fertilizer but i would say of course for the same reason because renewable energy has been developed in morocco for wind and sun and and uh, for wind and sun that are essential for the production of green nitrogen. So there is a lot of interest coming from some of Italian major groups to work here in Morocco, and we are doing our best actually to help uh, them and to support them. Mm -hmm. So my second point has to do with the, the cooperation between Italy and Morocco on this field. Uh, I have talked a little bit about uh, the, the pluses of Morocco from this point of view, but I would say that, that there are a lot of, uh, there is actually an intrinsic uh, understanding of uh, how important it is to develop this relation and what are actually the, the, the assets of the two countries to work together. And uh, there is actually an old value chain that is being built and for, to which we have to contribute. And, uh, this this value chain has to be based on four strategic axes. First of first, technological development. Second, attraction of foreign investments. Third, the development of industrial and infrastructural clusters. And related to that, that's extremely important. And this is something that has to do not only with Morocco, not only with the cooperation between Italy and Morocco, but also on the vision of Morocco as a platform towards Africa and towards actually a better understanding in the African continent of the importance of renewables. And this fourth strategic axis is training and education, and in particular of engineers and technicians. And we are really convinced that Morocco, from that point of view, can be a platform for the whole of Africa and for the work of Rest for Africa to actually have a new uh, elite of technicians and engineers in the whole continent that can actually help to develop renewable energies. I would actually skip to the conclusion because I don't want to bring to take too much of your time and, and I'm also eager to listen to, 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 to all uh, the, the, the person and colleagues uh, that are actually connected. One very important thing to understand is that there is a special relationship from the political point of view between Italy and Morocco. We have the joint statement, the declaration on multidimensional strategic partnership of November 2019, which gives a very solid framework to our relationship, political, diplomatic, security, and of course, in the economic, cultural, and scientific cooperation. So there is a huge, uh, there is a very solid framework for developing any kind of uh, initiatives and that work together in any kind of field. But I would say that even more important is what is happening now. And uh, what is happening now, and I will close to that, it actually shows the importance to reduce as much as possible the dependence from certain uh, countries and actors and the dependence from fossil fuel fuels. And there is a huge interest of uh, Italy to and uh, Morocco, but I would say of Italy to find new source of uh, renewable energies and uh, to actually uh, develop map partnerships from that point of view. We have uh, understood that, we have invested on that, and uh, we are actually preparing, Italy is preparing specific instruments for the development of renewable energies that will be actually uh, entrusted to our great international investment bank, which is Casa Depositi Prestiti, 
and to the rule group that makes reference to Casa Deposit Plasticity. And from that point of view, we will have a specific funds for international project uh, in the sectors uh, for developing renewable energy. This is uh, a contribution that Italy is actually foreseeing in the context of COP26 and the preparation for the next COP, but in general, to Italian companies willing to invest in, uh, in renewable energies in uh, the Mediterranean and in the African continent. If I can just uh, close with the final remark, just, and this is uh, like Roberto knows that very well because we discussed about that, I really think that the rest for Africa can be a fundamental pivot for Italian soft power in, uh, in, in this field. And uh, in general, but especially in this field. And I really think that there is, uh, apart from the international projects and investments that will follow up in the coming months and years in the sectors here in Morocco, there is a specific importance of the issue of training and education in this sector, not only of the general public, as I said, but also of technicians and the people that will work in this sector. And from that point of view, I really think that we can work together very well with our Moroccan friends. I had a lot of meetings, also including with the, with the, with the new Ministry of Energy, Minister of Energy, and there is actually a lot of scope and there is a lot of potentials for this cooperation to become one of the main pillars, if not the main pillar of the, our relationship and our friendship between Italy and Morocco. So thank you very much. I give back the floor to the moderator or to Roberto. Thank you, Ambassador, and looking forward to come to Morocco to see you and with you go to the, our uh, Moroccan friends to establish a strong program of cooperation. Uh, welcome thank anytime. Thank you so much. And now I pass the floor to Anna Rosbar. Uh, many of you know her. She is my ambassador, my, my private ambassador. She is actually the international partnership uh, uh, reference. Uh, she will be delighted to run uh, this meeting. So Anna, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for your keynote address. Thank you so much, Roberto, for these uh, warm uh, words of welcome. And I uh, would like to extend ourselves a warm welcome. Uh, welcome, bienvenue, ahlan bikum, to all of our colleagues, our partners uh, joining us uh, here today for this webinar online. Of course, we would prefer to do this in person, uh, but uh, we're happy to see you all here joining us from across Morocco across the African continent, across the Mediterranean as well, uh, as we sit here in our offices at Rest for Africa in uh, Rome. So Rest for Africa has the immense pleasure of um, hosting and organizing this webinar that tries to understand better how to accelerate uh, Morocco's clean energy transition and in which direction uh, that can go towards reaching a next level. Uh, my name is indeed Anna Rosa, I will be moderating today's session uh, and I have the great pleasure to be uh, introducing many of our most knowledgeable speakers and experts uh, from uh, across Morocco to give us some further insights uh, here. Now, uh, as was already alluded by Roberto and of course by uh, Ambassador, um, Morocco really has made a name for itself as a climate and an energy leader. Uh, the past uh, decade really has shown tremendous achievements uh, in, uh, in terms of its vision that it has set uh, in the past, what it has tried to realize, and therefore it's extremely interesting to see where it will go next and how this energy transition will sort of shift gears uh, in that respect. And there are a number of very interesting spaces to watch that present such opportunity, many of which already mentioned by uh, Ambassador and by uh, Roberto. And that's something that we will try to delve a little bit deeper in on during this webinar with the experts that we've gathered here today. We will be looking um, first 
getting a bit of a global understanding of where uh, Morocco's power sector stands today. We'll try to understand a few uh, pillars here of market opportunities uh, that will really help uh, shift gears on the energy transition. We'll look at the solar energy field and what that represents. We will be looking, of course, at uh, green hydrogen and power to X technologies and solutions. And we'll also be looking towards the aspect of smart cities and sustainable urbanization to give us a bit of an overview of uh, some spaces to watch. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to start our agenda here and bring uh, to the attention, bring to the floor our first speaker, who is um, Mr. Uh, Tayyip Amigrut. He's an expert in energy planning, uh, planner where uh, has over 30 years of experience uh, in uh, energy planning, project development and financing with a range of different development actors, but also within the financing world. And uh, Mr. Amigrut actually has uh, co-authored, co-studied one of our um, um, analytical works on the Morocco's power sector, trying to understand and give us some key observations as to where the power sector has come from, how it has evolved, where it stands today, and where it can go next. So, Mr. Amegoud, I think your presentation will give us a very good starting point for this webinar, setting the scene a bit as to where uh, we are today and how uh, we, what will be the play, uh, the state of play going uh, forward. So, Mr. Amegoud, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, many thanks to uh, Risk for Africa for the invitation uh, to take part uh, to take part in this uh, discussion uh, and for the opportunity to be part of this uh, esteemed panel. Uh, so, in this presentation, I will share uh, with you some of the preliminary results uh, and findings of a recent work uh, carried out through. Uh, a partnership uh, between uh, our hosts uh, today, Risk for Africa and uh, uh, UNICA, United Nations uh, Economic uh, Commission for Africa. Uh, the aim was to conduct an assessment of uh, the regulatory framework of the electricity sector in uh, selected African countries, uh, obviously including Morocco, uh, with a view uh, to enhancing uh, the effective uh, engagement of the private sector. Uh, sl first slide. Uh, let me keep the first slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so, as part of uh, this assessment, uh, we carried out a detailed overview uh, of the current legislation and regulations in, in relation to energy uh, strategy, uh, market framework, and governance. Uh, uh, with an investor's perspective in mind, we investigated the business uh, uh, environment, uh, uh, that's access to financing, uh, uh, tariffs policy, uh, uh, incentives, uh, uh, etc. Uh, uh, with regard to uh, uh, operating uh, the national power system, we provided an assessment uh, of the procedures and rules, uh, uh, for instance, in terms of uh, uh, system operation uh, uh, regulation, uh, grid access, uh, uh, grid infrastructures development. This qualitative data uh, uh, was translated uh, into uh, quantitative uh, uh, results and into a set of uh, KPIs uh, with a view to contrast uh, uh, this information uh, uh, with some uh, benchmark uh, uh, elements. Next slide, please. I will quickly uh, uh, run over the first two slides. Uh, I, I assume that uh, the institutional uh, uh, arrangements of the power uh, sector in Morocco are fairly known uh, to most of you, I guess. Uh, I would suggest that the institutional organization of the sector uh, is complex, uh, thanks in part to uh, the multiplication of actors uh, agencies, uh, stakeholders, and uh, to a certain extent, uh, um, there's an overlap in uh, responsibilities between uh, 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 these stakeholders. Uh, so, for instance, uh, while the Ministry of Energy is in charge of sector 
policy development, uh, the other stakeholders, uh, uh, including uh, operational players, utilities, uh, uh, are involved in in some uh, in instances and can dictate uh, and set the agenda. N next slide, please. Yeah, in terms of uh, market structure and organization, uh, Morocco uh, charted uh, its own distinctive path uh, with uh, an organization different uh, from the, as you can see, uh, from the prescribed uh, 1990s uh, model of uh, vertically uh, unbundled uh, utilities. Uh, and uh, the opening of some uh, uh, activities to market competition. Uh, so in Morocco, the market evolved uh, uh, from a vertically integrated uh, and tightly regulated uh, uh, monopoly to uh, and then in existent competition as well uh, to the current intermediate uh, model character characterized by uh, uh, significant uh, uh, private sector involvement. Uh, mainly in power generation and to some extent in uh, the distribution uh, uh, sub-activity as well. Uh, and recently by uh, uh, the gradual introduction of competition uh, to the renewable energy law. Next, yeah, next slide please. To picture what I have described, uh, uh, what I have just described, here we have a set of data points uh, the share of power generation by the national utility has fallen from uh, 90% in 91 to about 22% in 2019. Uh, in 2019, uh, the private sector accounted for more than, I think it exceeded now 50% uh, of installed capacity and uh, something like 80% of uh, generated output. Uh, the renewable uh, energy strategy or agenda is mainly implemented uh, through private sector participation uh, with the share of modern renewables exceeding today 15%. Uh, By modern renewables, I mean wind and solar exceeding 15% of total uh, annual generation. Next slide, please. Uh, based on the review, uh, I can mention the following few observations uh, uh, which characterize uh, the, sec the sector institutional framework. Uh, the current uh, sector policy is based on the 2009 uh, energy strategy to which uh, some adjustments uh, uh, were introduced, uh, mainly to accommodate the gradual uh, uh, shift towards uh, renewables. Uh, but other dimensions uh, of uh, energy policy uh, were not uh, changed or revised, uh, either in terms of uh, power sector organiz organization, uh, future fossil-based uh, uh, generation, energy efficiency, uh, energy access, uh, etc. Uh, power system planning is carried out by ONI, uh, the national uh, utility, do not legally bind in, uh, so sector, sector medium, and long-term uh, uh, master plans are prepared by ONI uh, and are not publicly available. Uh, the share of private sector is substantial, uh, but it is worth mentioning that uh, while the private sector uh, is strongly involved, uh, the market is not open yet, uh, or there is no competition in, uh, in any of uh, sector activities yet. Uh, Open, yeah, there's a new uh, regulation law uh, and a regulatory body was est uh, established, uh, which means that there's a trend towards uh, uh, unbund unbundling. Uh, open grid access is uh, enshrined in uh, uh, recent regulations, uh, but implementation is still uh, delayed. Uh, electricity tariffs are uh, uh, administered. Uh, and uh, involve uh, cross subsidies. Uh, next slide. Let's go to the next one. Uh, 
so in, in addition, as I mentioned, in addition to the qualitative uh, assessment, a systematic uh, quantitative analysis was carried out with the view to score uh, uh, the, the, the regulatory framework uh, uh, relative to some benchmark. Uh, this assessment was performed for each sector component, uh, i.e. for uh, generation, transmission and distribution, uh, along the following three dimensions, uh, openness, uh, assessing the exhaustivity and uh, degree of uh, detail of uh, the required uh, legislation. Uh, uh, that's, for instance, sector planning strategy and strategy, market structure, uh, private sector participation models, etc. The second dimension is uh, attractiveness uh, or sector economics. Uh, that's contracts regulation, economic regulation. Uh, access to financing, uh, uh, credit enhancement, uh, and other incentives. Uh, the third dimension is readiness or sector maturity. Uh, here we're talking about uh, system planning, uh, uh, grid code, um, grid access, uh, security standards, um, access to data. Uh, and each of these uh, uh, dimensions uh, uh, will be broken down. Uh, into different topics, some of which uh, I mentioned uh, when describing the dimensions uh, to cover the main area of within each dimension and ultimately uh, translated into uh, indicators uh, and uh, KPIs. Next slide, please. I apologize for uh, the, the, the missing uh, diagrams. I, I see that we're missing some of uh, the legends. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, yeah, so in case of Morocco, uh, uh, this analysis yielded uh, the, the following results uh, for the power generation subsector. Uh, overall, uh, Morocco's performance uh, is satisfactory in mass areas assessed uh, under the three dimensions. Uh, and these results confirm the readiness of uh, 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 the national policy and uh, regulatory framework to enable private sector participation in the generation market. Uh, uh, as you might expect, Morocco performs well in uh, uh, key areas uh, uh, such as private sector participation models. Uh, they are already established models and uh, well working models. Electricity sector governance uh, um, and procurement process uh, process in the open dimensions uh, 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 are showing good uh, marks as well, and in contract regulation in the attractiveness uh, dimension. Uh, however, Morocco faces some challenges uh, uh, in uh, some key policy and regulatory areas, such as uh, the adequacy of system planning. Uh, uh, and, and in the attractiveness dimension, topics like uh, economic regulation and support mechanisms are, uh, are, are key, key areas for improvement. Uh, next slide. Uh, moving to the transmission sub-activity, uh, the analysis of the policy and regulatory framework uh, 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 confirms uh, the current uh, uh, impossibility, if I might see, for the private sector uh, to invest in this uh, uh, market. Uh, as one could expect, uh, uh, the analysis shows a framework moderately uh, ready to attract private investors uh, and uh, still uh, um, several barriers uh, in all of uh, those uh, three dimensions. Uh, Next slide. In, for the distribution uh, uh, sub-activity, next slide, please. Uh, Jason, I think we're missing one slide. Can you can you revert back? Ah, oh, okay. We only have two charts. Okay, sorry for that. Yeah, again, sorry for, <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, normally there should be another chart here, another diagram, spider diagram showing uh, uh, something similar for uh, the distribution activity. 
and uh, uh, the, the results were quite similar to, to, to transmission. Uh, do the, the distribution subject represents uh, uh, more openness or a moderate uh, openness and attractiveness uh, uh, of, uh, for private investment. Uh, weaknesses uh, uh, were mainly witnessed or uh, uh, in terms of attractiveness, uh, in particular in terms of economic uh, 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 regulation and uh, credit enhancement as far as uh, the, the, the distribution activity is concerned. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, I would argue that uh, the power sector in Morocco uh, is in the midst of uh, significant change uh, in terms of the country's uh, commitment to furthering uh, reforms and accelerating uh, its energy transition. Uh, having said that, uh, there are some hurdles which uh, hamper uh, and delay a, a transition of the sector to open competition. Uh, I would mention the increasing large share of uh, long-term commitments, uh, PPAs, power purchase agreements. Uh, this energy supply, supply uh, uh, arrangements uh, amount for uh, more than 75% of national power output and won't expire uh, for most of them before uh, uh, 2040. Uh, so this uh, model is still favored with more projects, uh, more projects under uh, uh, development. Uh, the pricing policy uh, is rigid and uh, in certain respects uh, not transparent. Uh, cross subsidy subsidies uh, are involved, and uh, the, 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 the frequency uh, and rules of tariffs uh, setting or adjustments are are, are not uh, clarified uh, or are all available. Uh, sector organization uh, and grid access uh, rules uh, act uh, as an impediment to distribution uh, generation. Uh, and to deployment to the deployment of small uh, and medium-sized uh, renewable projects. Uh, so with that, I yield the floor. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tayeb, for this uh, comprehensive overview. I think this helps set uh, the backdrop for uh, the discussions going forward. We understand really from your uh, presentation, uh, which gives us the main observations of this report, of this regulatory review that um, you've completed, that really the, the power sector in Morocco has really gone through some significant change in the past decade, highlighting those points uh, where much progress has been achieved um, and that there still are a few barriers to overcome that might uh, help uh, um, accelerate further this energy transition, which is clearly uh, shifting into uh, another gear there. So thank you so much for making these points. And that uh, really gives us uh, the good next step uh, to um, enter into our first sort of focus area on um, indeed accelerating that energy transition by looking at a specific uh, space to watch on market opportunities. And that's the solar energy space. And I'd like to um, introduce our first of three speakers that will look at this thematic. Um, our first speaker here is uh, Mr. Ricardo Siliprandi, who is a senior principal at AFRI. Um, and he has over 15 years experience uh, and expertise in the electricity, the power market regulation, has worked on a number, uh, a very vast range of uh, African uh, countries and their markets here. Um, and what uh, Ricardo will do is will give us a sense of uh, some main observations of a new uh, uh, analysis that's been done on the potential of small-scale solar PV uh, applications uh, within that space. So please, uh, Ricardo, do enlighten us on uh, what we should know about uh, small-scale PV capacity and how that can contribute towards Morocco's uh, energy transition. Ricardo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna, and thank you for uh, uh having the opportunity to speak at this uh, very interesting webinar. So, uh, I I think you said uh, you already uh, summarized uh, what I will talk about. So we go into one of the uh, opportunity, uh, concrete opportunity to accelerate the um, uh, 
the development of renewables in uh, in Morocco. So uh, let's get to uh, to the start and uh, let's see uh, maybe let's uh, set the moment the scene uh, about the context. Uh, so if we can go on the next slide. So what happened in the past? So Morocco experienced a very uh, intense grow in terms of electricity demand driven by uh, growing uh, in GDP and population uh, and electrification. And this trend uh, is expected to uh, continue in the future. So generation is needed and Morocco needs uh, to, uh, to use and exploit its own um, uh, resources, which are renewables and reduce the dependence on, on the imported fuels. And uh, to do so, if we can go to the next slide, uh, uh, a profound reform of the electricity sector uh, has been uh, um, uh, intensified uh, even in the last year. Already, uh, Mr. Magro made uh, a, a clear um uh, a clear framework uh, represented a clear framework what uh, what is the situation now in uh, in morocco from regulatory perspective uh so uh, a lot have been and been done uh but there are few steps that can be uh, further improved uh to exploit some specific uh, uh let's say low hanging fruits that can boost the development of renewable in Morocco. And uh, uh, let's look to the targets in the next slide uh, and what happened uh, so far. So uh, if we can go to the next slides, please. Yeah, thank you. So uh, after, uh, at the same time uh, with the uh, regulatory review, some uh, um, uh, targets for renewable development has been already said in the past uh, and uh, uh, let's say met to some extent uh, uh, especially for wind and hydro as we can see from the chart where almost the target set for 2020 have been met but lagging a little bit behind uh, on uh, uh, on pv uh, that was for many uh, reasons uh, but uh, let's focus on the opportunities rather on what happened. And uh, one of, of the great opportunities is rep uh, represented by the small scale PV. Uh, the only already uh, estimated that there are 4.5 gigawatt of uh, potential in Morocco only for from uh, residential and, and uh, tertiary sector. So it could, could be even be larger if you consider um, um, uh, smaller scale uh, industry. Uh, so the opportunity is big to, and uh, it is something that can be catched uh, easily with some uh, in uh, rapid implementation. And uh, so what we want to represent today are some barriers that are still there to uh, to catch these low hanging fruits. So let, let's see uh, what which barriers are hindering this development. Uh, and we can see in the next slide. So we uh, just to say here we no no yes uh, but one thank you um, uh, just to speak the same language uh, already Mr. Amigro uh, introduced the concept of uh, openness attractiveness and readiness which is the uh, framework we analyze uh, uh, regulatory uh, um, readiness of the different countries uh, and uh, to, to, to make a long story short. Uh, uh, openness means uh, uh, there is an opportunity there, it can be done, and the market can be entered by private sector. Uh, attractive means uh, what it means, uh, so it's attractive, uh, there is a business case uh, with a return which is, makes sense. Uh, and readiness means uh, the market and regulation uh, is set to make this happen really, so to go to the COD of a project uh, and to have it operated uh, and energy of taken uh, and uh, um, introduced to the to the energy system. So there are uh, some barriers which are blocking uh, for the moment uh, uh, this uh, huge opportunity. And we can go to the next slide to see the first one. Um, the first one uh, it's uh, substantially uh, in, in no go. Uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, for a moment. Uh, uh, there is uh, um, 
uh, no uh, regulation for the grid connection of uh, on the low voltage, uh, which is uh, crucial for the small scale uh, for renewable energy. Uh, so it's something uh, that that is on the go uh, at the moment under discussion uh, and should be implemented shortly. But the money is not there, so uh, this is uh, totally blocking the the opportunity. But uh, set this uh, fine. Uh, the let's say the path is uh, I would say downward and easier, and we can go to the next slide and barrier. Uh, exactly, mm, which regards the um, to make the the uh, the opportunity attractive. So uh, a metering system and uh, for low voltage must be uh, must be set. Uh, in order to make uh, uh, to create a business case for an investment, and uh, for the moment, uh, regulation is set only for high voltage, but uh, for low voltage, it is not there. So it's uh, um, uh, it's envisaged it's envisaged by the laws, but uh, implementation is missing. So uh, only the last step is missing. So it's something that is really there. Then going downward. From uh, to the hill, there is, there is another barrier, um, which we, we can go to the next slide. Thanks. Which uh, we can consider uh, of minor importance uh, is uh, uh, which regards to some definition of uh, um, who is the uh, who can uh, can uh, can uh, consume uh, or can use the uh, the self consumption. Uh, and uh, still, uh, the full implementation of the role of the um, of the regulator, which is still not fully set. So we are living in between a situation where uh, this uh, this uh, governmental body needs to start its operation and and bring clarity to 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 everything. And. Um, um, and then four, uh, which is something more transverse across all the uh, the topics. So the independent regulator must uh, come in to make clarification and provide all the implementation and uh, and the regulation to uh, to activate uh, across uh, all the different uh, uh, characteristic of regulation. So this done, I think that. Uh, uh, the, the the situation would be fine to 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 attract uh, private investment and to kickstart that. And if we go to the next slide, only minor uh, elements uh, uh, remain, uh, just on the incentive schemes uh, and maybe to uh, create more awareness uh, and to. Um, um, to promote uh, a, a local PV market in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, competences in building panels, uh, which are mostly uh, based on import at the moment. So, um, as said, uh, um, one of the uh, once the, the, the low voltage connection regulation is done, uh, so that the main barrier is uh, is set. Uh, uh the net the the best net meter the, the best metering scheme and support scheme must be must be chosen and for this uh, we looked at some experience uh, around the world uh we can go to the next slide yes thank you so um uh in uh Mexico, vietnam and brazil but let's focus on the kind so here we have represented three opportunities uh of uh metering schemes uh, uh the so-called net metering schemes what does it mean it means that uh the self-consumption is set uh, only for uh energy produced and consumed at the same place uh, so uh on the on the rooftop of uh, whatever um and uh, uh uh, what the uh, consumer pays uh, is substantially the retail tariff uh, only on the net uh, used energy. So in this situation, uh, uh, there is no problem of profile of the renewables uh, because it's managed by the system. It's uh, very easy to, to do this. Uh, it's a very diffuse scheme. Uh, even in Europe, it's not like this uh, for a moment. Um, and uh, so it creates a very intense uh, 
uh, attractiveness, uh, but maybe on the long run uh, could not be the best, uh, uh, the most uh, sustainable because uh, uh, does not give a, a clear evidence uh, of the cost of the flexibility that is needed to use uh, to introduce this uh, renewable energy into the system. But it's a, a good kickstart. Uh, then there is uh, the second example uh, um, uh, where you have uh, a feed-in tariff uh, on the excess energy produced by the on-site uh, uh, plant, uh, uh, which is even an higher uh, attractive as because uh, uh, not only you um, have the, um, the intermittency of renewable managed, uh, but also you have a, a flat, uh, secure, um value for the energy produced uh, uh which creates also uh, a higher bankability for the project and uh, and so uh, an even higher um attractiveness but obviously uh any feeding tariff of uh direct incentives uh, uh it's uh, uh um, less visible for the future and so it's uh, uh less sustainable in terms of scale in the long term um there is another uh, similar one, uh, which is on the net metering, but it was interesting to be seen in Brazil, uh, where uh, this is uh, also uh, allowed uh, um, in the, uh, in, uh, for uh, energy produced and consumed in different places across the grid. So, which is very interesting because uh, could create uh, a, a, a very uh, good opportunity to deliver and develop renewable, but uh, requires to carefully manage how uh, this energy goes across the grid. So uh, requires some more attention and investment and cost on the grid side. So um, spanning across all of this, uh, uh, there is a, um, in, another scheme, uh, a scheme which combines this set, uh, which is the net billing scheme. So which creates uh, a different uh, tariff uh, for the surplus, uh, and uh, uh, the energy consumed, uh, which is the one which which gives the most uh, uh, cost reflective uh, um, uh, signals uh, to um, to the investor, and so it's the most uh, uh, sustainable in the long term, uh, with uh, a slightly less attractiveness. Uh, so, seeing, seeing these uh, potential ways to implement uh, this, uh, uh, to I mean this uh, uh, second body, so to set uh, any an attractive uh, metering scheme, uh, there are uh, a number of things that can be done. So, le let's see the, to the next slide what, what could be an approach, what we can suggest. So, uh, uh, first thing uh, we said, uh, um, uh, we need to solve the uh, the low voltage connection. Uh, so this is the first action, as we said. Uh, one way to uh, make it easier could be, for example, to uh, allow this only in uh, the zone of the grid, which already are enough strong and, and safe uh, to allow uh, an, an easier introduction, an easier connection, and. Uh, in second step and second stage into this other zone which are where the grid is weaker so it can, this uh, uh, from the um, structural perspective uh, and from the system uh, security perspective can be managed then we have uh, the second step that we said the net metering and maybe this uh, could be a mix of different intervention uh, for example to use uh, um, a net metering of a feeding tariff uh, to kick start uh, uh, and accelerate the, um, um, the the development at the beginning, and then uh, fading uh, to a net building, which may represent uh, a more sustainable long-term solution. Um, then also uh, to set up the different uh, the other bodies where we say which were minor but need to be uh, to be managed. So to define the project governance in a better way and. Uh, um, to accelerate the operation of the um, of the uh, um, of the regulator, and uh, maybe to promote uh, 
uh, diffusion uh, in terms of uh, uh, social awareness and maybe putting some obligation on the PV and uh, try to push the creation of a local uh, PV market uh, in, uh, and uh, to grow comp competence uh, in, uh, locally in Morocco. Thank you, Anna, and uh, I give back to, uh, back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Ricardo, uh, for uh, this, this very good overview. Uh, I, I will uh, use your own words. In fact, you see a very low hanging fruit in the area of, uh, in this vast area of what solar energy can provide, what the space therefore has been foreseen, as was in your second slide. But I specifically take note indeed that there's a lot of potential for this small scale um, PV of uh, 4.5 gigawatts for residential and tertiary sector. So that is really a, a vast space there to, to, to explore. Um, and that, you know, the self-consumption schemes thus allow and exist. Uh, there's a lot of interest here, but that the few barriers, notably on the, the low voltage grid connection, uh, the definitions of a few definitions on prosumers uh, and, and the regulatory side there um, could really help um, sort of unlock uh, further potential in that space. And I think that that's um, a, a very good point uh, that really uh, is, is, is good to include within this uh, range of opportunities that we're trying to, to, to find um, and to, to, to advance towards accelerating the energy transition in Morocco. So thank you so much for, for making these points. I think I'd like to turn now to um, Ms. Houda Bouchara from the Cluster uh, Solaire, who is a development manager there, who has uh, spent a lot of time working uh, previous to Cluster Solaire with international Morocco and Moroccan industry players focusing on uh, mechanical, electromechanical uh, 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 sectors, but now uh, runs the business development at uh, Cluster Solaire in Morocco and would be very interested to hear from you, uh, Huda, how you see um, the uh, that space uh, in the solar energy potential in Morocco, what Cluster Solaire is doing about this. And I, I understand that uh, you will give your presentation in French, so please, uh, Huda, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much in advance. Je vous remercie infiniment pour votre invitation. Je suis très, très heureuse d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui. Alors, euh, ma présentation, euh, vous pouvez aller vers le next slide. Donc, euh, ma présentation, euh, donc, je vais faire quand même un petit rappel euh, du contexte et des, des missions du, du cluster solaire, euh, les principales activités et réalisations euh, du cluster. Et je ferai quand même, euh, on a souhaité faire un retour d'expérience par rapport à un village 100% intégré euh, d'Idemhaj, euh, à Essaouira. Next step. Je vais faire le rappel de contexte. Next slide, s'il vous plaît. Alors, le développement de, des énergies renouvelables connaît, comme vous le savez, aujourd'hui et même il y a quelque temps, un contexte propice, une opportunité unique pour le développement du secteur. Euh, aussi bien euh, à l'international, avec une croissance soutenue des ENR sur une décennie, euh, aussi en Afrique, euh, une part encore trop faible de l'Afrique en termes de capacité renouvelable, 2%, et un potentiel pour nous euh, de développement énorme pour rattraper euh, ce retard. Il y a aussi le contexte marocain, donc la haute tension euh, qui est portée par une stratégie énergétique euh, audacieuse euh, marocaine, euh, il y a la moyenne tension, on est tous en train d'attendre euh, l'entrée en vigueur de la loi 1309 qui va libérer euh, le potentiel de la moyenne tension euh, et attirera les investissements privés euh, dans le secteur. Et il y a plusieurs investisseurs qui sont en attente de cette, euh, de cette loi. Donc, euh, il y a les applicatifs solaires. Donc, les applicatifs solaires... Euh, euh, comme euh, par exemple le chauffe-eau euh, solaire, euh, le PV en toiture, euh, le pompage. Donc euh, c'est nécessaire aussi bien pour le développement tant sur le marché domestique qu'à l'export. Next slide. Alors le cluster solaire euh, a ainsi été créé en 2014 pour accompagner l'écosystème local à répondre aux besoins de cette stratégie énergétique nationale. Donc euh, l'objectif, c'est effectivement atteindre et dépasser les 52% de la capacité installée à horizon 2030. La diminution euh, d'émissions CO2 euh, de peut-être plus que 13% à 2030. Donc l'ambition du cluster, c'est le développement d'une filière euh, industrielle ENR compétitive au Maroc à travers deux missions clés, développement des compétences et 
euh, le renforcement des capacités industrielles. Donc, je ferai un petit rappel euh, des objectifs. Donc, euh, nos objectifs, c'est la mise en relation des différents acteurs de la filière et maximiser les synergies, faciliter l'accès au marché pour les acteurs du secteur, soutien à l'innovation dans le secteur des énergies renouvelables et les green tech et la promotion de la filière et mise en avant des compétences et de l'expertise locale. Next slide. Donc, euh, je dirais qu'à partir de cette année, donc, le cluster euh, solaire s'élargit. Donc, euh, je voulais partager aussi cette information avec vous. On s'élargit aux ENR, aux, à l'efficacité énergétique et des énergies euh, euh, durables. Donc, euh, notre principale mission, je dirais, c'est la création de richesses dans le secteur ENR, anticiper, accompagner l'évolution du secteur, le renforcer les compétences des membres et euh, les promouvoir à travers les activités de renforcement de compétences et la communication à l'événementiel. Donc, quatre ambitions clés, être un cluster reconnu au niveau international, être un acteur de référence dans les ENR, jouer un rôle fédérateur et catalyseur du secteur, et être un acteur de développement économique. Next slide, please. Donc, je voulais aussi partager avec vous euh, les logos de, de, de nos membres. Ce n'est pas exhaustif, on a à ce jour 200 membres du secteur. On a les fédérations, on a les développeurs, les EPCistes, on a aussi euh, les centres de recherche, ainsi que les universités. Next slide, s'il vous plaît. Donc, le cluster propose des services à forte valeur ajoutée, répondant aux besoins de, de, de nos membres. Donc, accompagnement à la, création des, à la création et le développement, le renforcement des compétences à travers euh, l'assistance technique, la formation et le, les GT, les groupes de travail, le networking et l'événementiel à travers, à travers les mises en relation et euh, le lobbying, et la veille et intelligence économique à travers, bien sûr, l'accès aux appels d'offres, la réalisation d'études sectorielles et le service paye. Next, please. Alors, ici, c'est juste l'organigramme, la gouvernance, euh, juste pour vous dire qu'une euh, gouvernance représentative du secteur, euh, notre président, c'est le président euh, de Mazen. On a aussi des administrateurs permanents, Mazen, Fenelec et Lafine. On a un comité scientifique où il y a les institutions marocaines et plusieurs collèges représentatifs du, du secteur solaire. Next slide, please. Donc, le cluster solaire, a, on a souhaité segmenter le marché en projets énergétiques de grande envergure, en application ONR et entrepreneuriat vert. Donc, euh, on essaie, l'objectif, c'est de contribuer à l'intégration industrielle de grandes entreprises dans les projets énergétiques, structurer et dynamiser un marché fragmenté de TPE, PME euh, concernant les applicatifs ENR et créer de l'emploi vert et promouvoir les green tech pour les porteurs de projets entrepreneuriat vert qu'on accompagne un petit peu de bout en bout de l'idée au prototypage. Next slide, s'il vous plaît. Next. Alors, next. Alors, les principales, je dirais, activités du, du cluster. Donc, euh, effectivement, pour euh, les grands projets, on essaye à court terme d'informer, de mettre en relation et de former euh, les industriels. Euh, un partenariat technique, le financement, l'aide au financement, accompagné à la mobilisation de financement pour accompagner les investissements et l'innovation et accompagnement à la production. Next. Alors, pour les applicatifs solaires, alors, euh, la création de ce marché euh, durable, il repose sur euh, quatre piliers essentiels à opérationnaliser. Je dirais contrôler qualité. Donc, euh, le cluster a créé un label TACA Pro pour euh, un petit peu structurer le marché et éviter les problèmes de qualité et de déficience des applicatifs. Donc, industrie, le renforcement des compétences et des capacités de la filière, le financement et la garantie, mise en place des produits de financement adaptés aux spécificités des industriels locales et euh, locaux, et cadre réglementaire, je dirais que tout le monde attend le cadre réglementaire, la libération de, de la moyenne tension et euh, l'adoption de, de la loi 1309. Next steps, 
next slide, s'il vous plaît. Alors, euh, ici, c'est Zoom Entrepreneuriat. Donc, euh, c'est juste pour vous dire comme quoi on accompagne les entrepreneurs de la phase sourcing à la phase de sortie. Next step. Encore, les activités de renforcement des compétences. Donc, euh, on a à ce jour euh, accompagné euh, 5800 bénéficiaires de, de webinaires et de formations. Donc, euh, on fait des formations spécifiques, euh, euh, spécifiques à notre secteur. Donc, euh, le PV en grid, off-grid, dans le juridique, dans la partie euh, PPA, ESCO, dans la partie, je dirais, efficacité énergétique, euh, dans tout ce qui est euh, thermique, euh, à froid mais aussi tout ce qui est technico-commercial. Next slide, please. Donc, euh, on a aussi créé euh, quatre groupes de travail thématiques euh, pour maximiser la contribution et l'implication de nos membres, donc à travers euh, un groupe de travail applicatif solaire, le renforcement de capacités, l'export euh, Afrique et l'intégration industrielle. Next, please. Donc, euh, comme je vous ai dit, on a créé un label. Donc, c'est un label Takapro euh, PV+, euh, PV, PV+, et pompage. Donc, le PV, c'est plus pour euh, adapter aux petites puissances photovoltaïques, des systèmes photovoltaïques de petite puissance. Le PV+, c'est euh, le système photovoltaïque de moyenne et grande puissance. Et euh, Takapro euh, pompage, c'est euh, plutôt pour euh, l'agriculture, euh, l'eau potable et l'adduction euh, de l'eau en général. Donc, euh, on a labellisé depuis 2019 euh, une centaine d'installateurs photovoltaïques. Next, please. Alors, on a lancé aussi une caravane régionale. Donc, euh, première euh, caravane régionale, on l'a lancée en 2020. Donc, euh, dans la région sous à agadir euh, La vérité, on a eu un franc succès. On a eu, euh, malgré le Covid, euh, euh, 200 participants. Euh, donc, euh, on a voulu effectivement le faire en 2021, mais à cause du Covid, on a été contraint de le reporter. Et il, sera, euh, il est prévu pour Marrakech, la région de Marrakech, euh, pour le 14 avril 2022. Next slide. Donc, euh, exemple de publication en faveur de l'écosystème ENR. Donc, euh, on fait euh, plusieurs études, plusieurs guides, euh, rapports. Donc, on a effectivement euh, finalisé l'étude sur le dim dimensionnement du marché des applicatifs solaires euh, en 2021, qui a été aussi partagé avec notre partenaire Rest for Africa. Donc, on a effectivement mené, euh, on vient de clôturer le guide euh, sur le financement vert. Euh, euh, ça reprend toute... Euh, euh, tous les financements en faveur euh, du secteur vert, donc euh, plusieurs publications. Next euh, slide. Next. Networking et événementiel, donc euh, effectivement grâce à cette nouvelle dynamique et, et euh, à notre visibilité au niveau national et international, le, on a pu effectivement signer des partenariats stratégiques euh, aussi bien avec des clusters internationaux, un réseau médiatisé, des partenaires internationaux et des partenaires nationaux. Et je voulais juste préciser qu'on est labellisé par le ministère de l'Industrie. Next slide, please. Donc, euh, tout dernièrement, on a signé euh, plusieurs conventions aussi euh, avec UIR, l'Université internationale de Rabat, Massir et Technopark. Next slide. On a aussi signé euh, des, une convention avec euh, Res for Africa, euh, avec euh, la Banque Populaire et euh, bien entendu le CRI de la Next slide, please. Donc, euh, on a effectivement euh, organisé plusieurs événements pour faire connaître le cluster, pour promouvoir ses membres et pour sensibiliser aussi le secteur pour euh, effectivement adopter la transition énergétique. Donc, c'est des ateliers sectoriels pour des rencontres B2B avec EDF, TSK, des journées euh, sur le mécanisme de financement euh, des projets ENR et efficacité énergétique et bien d'autres euh, événements. Next slide. Effectivement, on a, on a effectivement été, euh, on a pris part à plusieurs conférences, workshops. Euh. Next slide.
On a aussi, euh, c'était aussi, euh, on a été aussi à l'international. On a accompagné nos membres euh, euh, à l'international, aussi bien à Berlin, l'USA, euh, euh, Lyon. On a aussi euh, fait participer euh, les entreprises membres avec nous euh, au Salon marocain, à Gadir et à Meknes et autres. Next slide. Donc, euh, je voulais effectivement partager avec vous aussi euh, euh, les projets collaboratifs qu'on a pu développer à, à ce jour. On a quand même une cinquantaine de projets collaboratifs. Je veux effectivement, je vais donner quelques exemples de projets collaboratifs. Next slide. Donc, développement d'une unité pilote mobile innovante de traitement des eaux usées industrielles euh, en partenariat avec Step Mobile qui a été réalisé. Next slide. On a le projet CSP industriel à petite échelle qui est aussi en cours de développement au niveau de Bitouma en partenariat avec Bitouma UIR. Next slide. On a le projet robot de nettoyage de panneaux photovoltaïques en partenariat avec Eco Tapra Service. Le prototype est en cours de finalisation. Next slide. On a aussi le kiosque solaire All in One, euh, donc en partenariat avec Solar Trium et Azolis. Le prototype est en cours de finalisation. Next slide, please. Et on a lancé tout dernièrement l'initiative visant la distribution de packages de stations électriques mobiles auprès, auprès des deux ménages, donc Skoura, 40 ménages, et Rassat, 54 ménages, donc en partenariat avec Mag Power, Mazen et Aqua Power, en cours de préparation. Next slide, please. Donc, il y a le village solaire Idmhash, premier village solaire 100% autonome en Afrique. On en est fiers, la vérité. C'est un projet qui a été mené, inauguré en 2019, euh, en partenariat avec Mazen, Le Petit Olivier, Clean Energy, Intermarché et l'association Essaouira Mugador, qui a été réalisé effectivement en 2019 et qu'on a souhaité euh, partager avec vous cette, euh, un retour d'expérience par rapport à, cette, euh, à ce village solaire 100% autonome. Next slide, please. Next slide. Voilà, donc, euh, principaux caractéristiques du projet. Donc, euh, c'est localisation commune Unara, village Idmhaj, Sawira. 15 habitations rapprochées, euh, je dirais euh, 65 habitants, 15 kWh, 32 panneaux solaires pour une capacité de 8,32. Énergie est consommée 25 kWh par an. La solution technique, c'est centrale solaire photovoltaïque avec stockage sur batterie et réseau mini-grid avec un budget de 1,8 million de dirhams. Next slide. Donc ici, c'est juste pour voir que effectivement le village était non électrifié et qu'on a mis en place une centrale mini-grid pour connecter le village. Next slide, please. Alors, euh, le village solaire a été effectivement intégré, a été inauguré en 2019 avec euh, l'installation de solutions solaires, le développement d'une activité génératrice de revenus, donc euh, les coopératives pour le concassage de l'argan. Euh, et aussi, on a mis en place un, une école de préscolaire pour les enfants de 4-5 ans. Next slide, please. Donc là, c'est juste pour illustrer les composantes ENR. Next slide. Et aussi pour euh, un petit peu vous montrer que les femmes de villa village, il y avait une coopérative qui a été créée. Next slide. Donc là, c'est un retour euh, pour euh, un petit peu le village solaire, euh, un petit peu le budget global, 1,7 million de dirhams. Les composantes de projet. Next slide, please. Alors, euh, ce projet a été effectivement euh, euh, fait euh, pas avec euh, des partenaires, donc Intermarché, Petit Olivier et l'OVA, Province des Sawira, Clean Energy, Mazel, Association Mogador et nous-mêmes qui, qui ont fait le, la levée de fonds, la mobilisation des parties prenantes autour du projet, la coordination et la coordination. Allez-y, next slide. 
je sais que j'ai plus de temps, je, je confirme, mais bon, je veux juste vous dire comme quoi c'est un projet qui nous tient à cœur. C'est un projet que, effectivement, on peut démultiplier un petit peu partout, aussi bien en Afrique qu'au Maroc. Euh, la vérité, on souhaite euh, effectivement le démultiplier. Il faudrait faire des levées de fonds pour pouvoir aider toutes les, tous les villages euh, à passer de, de, du noir euh, à la lumière. On peut passer au next, euh, next slide, juste pour euh, vous donner quand même un retour, euh, retour d'expérience, les facteurs clés de succès de ce village et les difficultés quand même rencontrées sur place. Donc, euh, les facteurs clés, je dirais que c'est un business model à, à démultiplier. Euh, mais aussi, euh, on a souhaité euh, faire quand même un, un prélèvement d'un montant sur la vente d'argan euh, de la coopérative pour assurer un petit peu la continuité de, de ce village, parce que euh, d'ici euh, peut-être cinq ans, euh, ils auront peut-être un problème à faire un, un changement de cette batterie euh, qui est coûteuse, qui est de 150 000 dirhams, et c'est nécessaire quand même de, de prévoir dans le business model euh, la possibilité euh, de, de garder quand même et de, de, de garder ce montant. Alors, c'est un, une dimension intégrée, c'est un développement local parce qu'on développe aussi bien, le, le, je dirais, le village autour de, des ENR. Donc, euh, on a fait la, co la, la coopérative, euh, l'école, euh, il y a plusieurs applicatifs, donc euh, je dirais le four solaire, le pompage solaire, le hammam qui est avec le chauffe-eau solaire, c'est tout intégré avec la mini-grid pour tout ce qui est électrification de, de ce village. Donc la difficulté était l'équité territoriale parce que eux ils avaient cette chance, mais les autres pas, les autres villages. Donc euh, l'appropriation du, pro, du, du projet par la population locale, je pense qu'il fallait effectivement les impliquer dès le départ. Et la surexploitation des batteries, parce qu'ils ne s'y connaissent pas, même malgré la formation et la maintenance de ce de, qu'on a fait. Donc, on a fait une formation aux, aux personnes du, du village, mais euh, on a eu quand même un retour assez, assez Merci. positif. Merci beaucoup, Anna. Et je suis désolée d'avoir été dépassée quand même le temps. Le, 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 les, 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 le retour d'expérience est absolument très pertinent et très intéressant. Voilà que je suis malheureusement pour euh, afin de, de respecter les délais pour euh, les autres pr euh, présenteurs. Donc merci beaucoup Rouda pour euh, merci votre... à vous. Merci merci et euh, merci beaucoup d'avoir euh, mis euh, mis en évidence euh, le travail que fait Cluster Solaire, euh, à quel point elle regroupe tous les acteurs principaux euh, de l'énergie euh, au Maroc et à quel point elle essaie donc, vraiment de euh, construire un, un marché durable euh, des énergies renouvelables en regardant euh, la chaîne de valeur entière donc et euh, le renforcement de capacité euh, et les entrepreneurs euh, et les formations ainsi que les labels, les certifications euh, dans, euh, dans ces domaines-là euh, avec euh, un soutien de toute analyse très profond. Donc, il y a beaucoup d'exemples de projets très concrets qui étaient très intéressants. Mal malheureusement, le temps ne, ne, ne nous suffisait pas. Oui, Donc, merci comprends. beaucoup, Rouda, et je souhaite tout de suite euh, passer au prochain uh, speaker. I'd like to um, now move towards our next speaker, who's Mr. Ahmed uh, Ben Larabi who joins us from Irizen this time, and I think even from uh, Ben Gerir in the Green Energy Park. Um, he is responsible for partnerships and business development uh, at Irizen, has a vast experience on the solar energy uh, uh, space with Irizen itself, currently working on um, uh, a certification laboratory at uh, for PV modules, in fact, at Ben Gerir. So it will be uh, very interesting to have his take here on how uh, uh, Irizen looks at uh, the small-scale uh, uh, solar uh, project space, how that can in fact answer some local energy needs for the domestic uh, 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 consumption departure here. And uh, we'd really like to um, ask him to take the floor now. Um, Mr. Uh, Benarabi, the floor is in fact yours. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, I'm waiting just for the presentation to, to be shown. Oh, great. So next slide, please, just to gain a little bit more time on that. So before starting, I, I would like just to precise one thing, since I, I, I'm going uh, last after all those speakers, they should have started the presentation with a spoiler alert, since I might repeat some uh, data and some uh, experiences that have been done. So before going into the main topic, uh, green, uh, 
Irizen, the research institute in solar energy and new energies, has been created in 2011 under the ages of the Ministry of Energy Transition and uh, Sustainable Development, with two main missions being, first one being uh, the funding agency financing some project and uh, uh, a second experience, uh, the same as the solar village presented uh, just now by our colleagues from the solar cluster, uh, there was another experience led by Arizen and financed by Arizen through the University of Qadir Iyad and uh, some local industrials uh, to set up a solar village in the region of uh, Tafraut. So basically, it's, uh, we are working in a complementary state uh, to, to an approach to make sure that all villages in Morocco might benefit from uh, those experiences. The second uh, mission of Irizan is to set up a testing platform for different domains. Uh, the main goal through those two missions is to support the government and its renewable strategy through research, development and innovation. Next slide, please. Uh, so basically, uh, so far, there is uh, two uh, platforms that are operational, being the Green Energy Park, where uh, I'm based, uh, dedicated to solar, uh, as well as the Green and Smart Building Park, uh, that is uh, in the final phases of construction and will be operated uh, starting uh, the second quarter of this year, uh, dedicated for energy efficiency in buildings, smart grids, and uh, electric and sustainable mobility. The Green H2A, uh, dedicated for green hydrogen, but I will let my colleague, Rashid Samir Rashidi, uh, elaborate on the matter uh, during his presentation. Uh, two platforms that are in the pipe, uh, dedicated uh, respectively, one for the Nexus Agriculture and Renewables, and the other for the Nexus Water and Renewables. And finally, uh, one of the platforms that are under construction, and this is to uh, consolidate the positioning of Morocco as a technology hub and <coughs> um, main point for sharing knowledge and know-how that has been uh, accumulated in the field. And that will be, this platform will be based in Ivory Coast uh, and will be uh, a sister to the Green Energy Park here. And, will allow complementary of testing uh, for uh, solar technologies in both regions, arid and semi-tropical. Next slide, please. So basically, Green Energy Park uh, has three main uh, departments, one dedicated for solar photovoltaics, another one for solar thermal, and finally one that is dedicated for modeling, as well as uh, it led some commercial activity based on the expertise that had been developed through those uh, four or five years uh, since its inauguration in 2017, uh, being outsourced services for companies uh, to accompany in renewable project development, as well as a certification lab. One uh, direction or department that had been created uh, last year is the one uh, of valorization, and that will help uh, go to the market all uh, project that have achieved results, significant results, uh, and industrialize them uh, in the local uh, Moroccan context, as well as, well as the, the, the African context. And finally, one service dedicated for training in collaboration with the University of Mohammed VI Polytechnic. Next slide, please. So, um, the main mission, uh, as I said, are applied research where uh, the creation and transfer of know-how is uh, the main uh, topic on that matter, and it is led by the universities, uh, Arizan, and uh, the main uh, teams of the Green Energy Park, the training activities, uh, where uh, the, the focus here is the knowledge creation through the practice and research, and finally, the business creation uh, through the creation of st startups and spins offs uh, with our researchers to encourage them to go into entrepreneurship based on their uh, research projects. Next slide, please. So those are just a snapshot on the main activities that you get for the thematic I'm, uh, I'm uh, presenting, uh, being solar photovoltaic especially, and the main axis on the roadmap uh, of research is how we can reduce uh, the LCOE uh, either be it uh, in the system 
uh, or as the technology and the architecture development product that are more suited for uh, harsh condition, uh, especially desert condition, as well as straightening the integration and application of photovoltaics in different uh, sectors, uh, not only residential and uh, industry, but also agriculture and other uh, type of application. As for the smart grids, of course, it goes uh, in parallel with uh, the schematic uh, being the optimization of cell conception and integration of renewables, and basically uh, solar development of smart grid solution as well uh, as development of innovative solution to encourage electric mobility. So all those schematics are linked in interlinked in between, uh, and different teams are leading different projects so far. More than forty projects on those schematics. Uh, Please go on ahead. So the segment platform, the Green and Smart Building Park, is mainly dedicated for uh, energy efficiency in buildings and uh, green construction, as well as smart grids. And as you can see, there is a four hectare uh, in front of you. So this is four hectares uh, where there is different construction and small houses uh, hosting small PV systems of uh, five kilowatt each. And the idea here is to, to interconnect and have different configuration of microgrids uh, that will be linked to a grid simulator just to check on uh, how it could impact uh, the, 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 the actual national grid before going into the experiment. So simulation uh, with hardware in the loop will be led in this platform and uh, we have the hand to configure those microgrids uh, from a small city up to, I mean a small house, up to a big city such as Casablanca. Uh, basically all the activities uh, have already started from a theoretical aspect, but the experiments uh, will start officially uh, on the next quarter of this year. Next slide please. Um, yeah, so basically here is the different aspect of this platform. So we have the main labs of test field uh, that have been converted into production lines uh, for prototyping uh, and development of product as well as their industrialization for the benefit of uh, our researcher and the Moroccan researchers in general that are willing to go into the adventure of entrepreneurship. A solar village, uh, there is the remain actually of the solar decathlon Africa that have been held in Morocco and hosted by uh, this platform uh, previous to the COVID-19 crisis in, 29, uh, in uh, September 2019. Uh, as well as a smart campus where there is different building with different architecture and uh, passive and active houses that are interconnected, again, to basically uh, have an applied R&D and developing concept for the future city of Africa. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a snapshot uh, of uh, the Green Energy Park Morocco Ivory Coast. So as I said, uh, it will be a complementary platform uh, to uh, the Moroccan one, its uh, bigger sister. Uh, it is based the, at the capital of Ivory Coast, Yamoussoukro, uh, at the uh, National Institute uh, Polytechnique, uh, Ufoué Boigny, uh, where there will be different pilot projects as well uh, for application of solar into uh, agriculture, valorization of uh, agricultural waste as a mean to produce uh, green gases and uh, generate heat. Uh, some demonstrator for solar uh, photovoltaics with different technologies to compare uh, the behavior of each system in local condition as well as the modules behavior itself independently from the system in local conditions. And uh, of course, since it is hosted in a university, there will be many training sessions uh, on it. I guess I overstepped on the thing. So uh, please, next slide to go into the main topic. Five more minutes. Next slide. Uh, yeah, so basically the Moroccan context has been already uh, explained by my colleagues. So just please go ahead. Next. 
And so basically we achieved so far 64 percent of renewables where photovoltaics account for 7517 uh, megawatts uh, 751 megawatts uh, accounting for seven percent next slide Uh, those are the large-scale uh, programs that have been done in Morocco, where solar so far account for something like 2,001 megawatt uh, of installed capacity or to be installed capacities. Uh, next slide, please. As big, large-scale uh, photovoltaic uh, plants. Um, as shown earlier by uh, the Italian colleague, uh, the, law, the the small uh, utility, uh, I mean the small uh, PV systems uh, can account for 4.5 uh, gigawatt potential, and so far more than 500 megawatt in terms of solar pumping have been installed throughout Morocco. Next slide, please. So basically, the main uh, numbers to uh, get from this uh, schematic is that only in 2020, uh, up to 95 megawatt have been installed as decentralized PV installation throughout Morocco, uh, and it has achieved an accumulated uh, power of 684 megawatt up to 2020 of decentralized uh, systems in general. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, a little bit the history of all the law regulating uh, the, regulating the, the, the power sector of renewables, the last one being the law 8221 related to auto production, allowing industrials, for instance, to fit in up to 10% of their annual production into the grid uh, as net metering. And uh, this law can, even though there still have some calibration to be done on it, can uh, boost uh, quite highly the PV market in Morocco. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, as introduced earlier by Anna, uh, we are under uh, the process of accrediting our platform as ISO 17025 uh, in collaboration as well with uh, an Italian uh, laboratory test being Kiwa. Uh, for the testing of modules. This will be the first step uh, toward uh, setting up an infrastructure of quality in Morocco for uh, the uh, photovoltaic product. The next steps being the inverters as well as uh, the batteries. Uh, next step. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so basically uh, COVID-19, even though has made quite the challenges and the breaks, uh, have also uh, offered Morocco opportunity for local integration, uh, basically for adding value as well as with the conjecture of uh, the CO2 tax that will be installed. And since all in 67% uh, of the Moroccan exportation are going to the Europe, so basically there is a huge opportunity to decrease the costs. And next slide, please. As you will see, prices of photovoltaic are increasing. Uh, since uh, the last quarter, and this offers a huge opportunity to set up uh, in Morocco uh, local manufacturing for PV panels. And we sh we've seen that many industrials are going toward this uh, approach. Next slide, please. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, Morocco has achieved so far 37% of renewable share by 2020, where, uh, sorry for the number, it's uh, 751 megawatt in, in big, large scale. Uh, a strong commitment from the government to go uh, into large scale programs uh, for the development of utility scale PV plants. Morocco also is transforming uh, and transitioning to becoming an industrialized country, needing straightening to, uh, to the electricity capacity. And uh, finally, it will be uh, a great opportunity to make Morocco position itself as a technology hub for solar technology in the region. Last slide, please. And this is just to uh, tell you that as a uh, research institute, we are uh, committing to support this transition uh, by uh, offering all the expertise that have been accumulated since our beginning of activities 
up to now uh, in, to accompany industrials to set up uh, renewable system into their uh, offices, as well as some mission for energy efficiency by digital uh, transitioning or energy services as such as audit, as well as there is the transition of electric mobility and where we are offering some strategic planning as well as engineering. So thank you for your attention and sorry, Anna, for uh, going a little bit off. But thank you, Ahmed. Uh, we really should have uh, a, a, a lot more time, in fact, to delve into detail uh, because uh, there is a lot of, of um, how to say, extremely interesting information coming out of the specific uh, point of analysis that you're pointing towards. So really, the, the opportunity is potential. I mean, Irizen on one side really does uh, um, uh, has been doing for quite some time now some very interesting uh, work in applied R&D activities here, pushing forward, um, sort of laying the barriers further for uh, electric and PV development. I understand that you're working very hard on solar uh, PV and smart grids, sort of this entire uh, space, um, that a lot of training and business creation comes uh, with that, but that uh, much is tying into uh, smart cities here as well, into uh, the energy efficiency space, uh, and it's interesting to see that there is some international cooperation happening uh, with other countries that are also trying to really um, set themselves apart as hubs there. But most specifically, I think that the testing laboratory um, and the certification here of, 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 uh, of, of PV modules really indicate what direction that we're headed in, uh, because that really shows where the opportunities lie for local integration across the value chain in that respect, and how uh, that also uh, sort of translates into a sector in of itself with, with lots of skills, with uh, lots of applications um, uh, spilling over from there. So I think that uh, that was sort of a, a key message there, at least I will, I will recall from, from your uh, presentation. So thank you so much, Ahmed. Uh, if you allow me just one sentence. Uh, one sentence. International <laughs> cooperation. Uh, actually, uh, we are main, mainly focused on uh, adding to the fact that we are cooperating with Europe and other developed countries. We are also focusing on uh, reaching out to our brothers in Africa uh, through a network that we've initiated in 2017 called Green Africa Innovation Network, where we are trying to uh, set up this uh, whole network of research infrastructures and universities uh, from each country of the 51 uh, African countries. Very good. Uh, taking note of that, because uh, also for us for Africa, this is a very important uh, initiative to take uh, uh, note of uh, and, and follow in, in which direction that will be headed. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for this points. And I'd like to turn now, I mean, uh, sort of we have a, a full view now, but of a 360 of the solar energy uh, uh, space. I'd like to now transition slightly towards uh, another very big space to watch, which is the power to X in the green hydrogen space. And for this, I'd like to uh, bring um, Mr. Mr. Samir Rashidi, who is the uh, Chief Scientific Officer at uh, Irizen as well. So we're staying within the Irizen space, uh, showing again uh, all the work that, that uh, Irizen is doing, in fact. Um, and he will explain uh, a little bit more as to how uh, green hydrogen can, in fact, contribute to that Morocco, to the clean energy transition, what space it can take in there, and uh, what the expectations are going forward. Uh, Samir, the floor is yours, and I really would like to ask you to stick with time, in fact, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, for this uh, kind introduction. And thank you very much for the organizer for the uh, uh, the opportunity to speak. Uh, this is really a pleasure and a great honor for me to to be among you today and also to report somehow the advances we, we have done as a as a country on this subject that is uh, somehow a, a hot topic, as, uh, as Anna has uh, previously said. I, without uh, any further ado, I would like to go to the next slide, please. Yeah, this is the starting point. This is a study from the, uh, uh, or a snapshot from the study uh, by the World Energy Council done in 2018, where Morocco has been identified as one of uh, potentially leaders uh, uh, countries in in the in the business of of power to x uh, we have been invited to review this study uh, kindly by the the authors and uh, in the review process we have seen that uh, uh, okay we had a lot of potential and, we, and i would go through that afterwards but uh, uh, we had uh, somehow uh, uh, some warnings or some red, red flags as we say and it is put, put, mainly around the, uh, the political support and also the awareness uh, uh, of the subject. So then, uh, uh, next slide, please. 
uh, uh, I mean, building on uh, the strength of the country, mainly, of course, high renewable resources, both on solar and and uh, and and uh, and wind, uh, but also all what have done as a legacy in the ten uh, in the last ten years. And uh, my previous colleagues and mates have already spoken about this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, let's say green decade we have been or solar decade we have been uh, witnessing in morocco at a really large scale but we have also additional uh, arguments or or a positive context in terms of uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, geographic positioning connectivity with grid and uh, and electricity to europe which is one of our main uh, uh, foreseen markets for this uh, economy, of course, uh, a local demand for green uh, uh, molecules and also growing uh, efforts on R&D and innovation, which is also a key to deploy such an economy in the region. Uh, next, next slide, please. So this, uh, starting from the uh, 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 World Energy Council, then we have done our homework uh, mainly by taking uh, also some uh, internal or in-house studies in order to see, uh, of course, with the support of, uh, of partners, mainly the uh, uh, GIZ, the German Cooperation uh, Agency, that helps us also to go through the potential, go through the uh, potential market, the potential, let's say, uh, 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 resources here in Morocco, but also uh, a third study where we have uh, tried to focus on what could be a, a roadmap uh, uh, for uh, for Morocco in this regards, and this is uh, uh, this uh, third study has resulted in what has been published uh, last August uh, in terms of uh, roadmap for green hydrogen in Morocco and green molecules. In the meantime, we have uh, uh, succeeded in also tying some partnerships and and uh, uh, and uh, let's say agreements with key stakeholders or key countries in this regard, and also we have. Uh, uh, created uh, back in 2019 the Green Hydrogen uh, Commission, uh, uh, National Commission on Green Hydrogen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, that was just a presentation. Yeah, this is the main, let's say, composition of the, uh, the National Commission on Green Hydrogen. It's mainly public institutions, so the ministries and also key stakeholders of the energy sector. Next slide, please. And the idea of uh, of uh, of the roadmap was also to yeah of course it has brought some uh, the, by the way the roadmap is uh, or the uh, let's say the the publication is uh, is uh, is publicly available you could download it from the uh, website of the the our ministry and uh, among the action plan that was or the recommendations that were made the idea was uh, for us as a research center was to focus on a sort of a uh, 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 preparing the ground for local integration and also advanced R&D and the innovation concerning this uh, uh, topic. And next slide, please. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, and in terms of uh, uh, deployment uh, uh, concerning the market opportunities, we uh, uh, have identified mainly two applications, as uh, 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 Roberto said at the beginning, uh, we're, it's not really about only about desert tech, but we really this time would like the the demand or the uh, need for export is coming from us also uh, because we have identified a huge potential for 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 exports and these exports will help us not only to sell green molecules but also to develop local uh, industry uh, both for uh, for renewables in the uh, uh, as as a source for of energy but also a green chemistry or a green heavy industry that we could also develop uh, uh, locally. And the second uh, niche or uh, or segment we could uh, use as a market is the local demand of OCP, mainly uh, about green ammonia. We are importing 2 million tons per year of green ammonia. This is, if we'd like to transform it, from it sorry, into uh, a cata uh, electrolysis capacity that would be around five to five to six gigawatt of electrolysis, which is really huge. Uh, other application may arise in the time, but I must agree uh, or I must confess, uh, sorry, that these are only, let's say, assumptions uh, about local use of uh, uh, green hydrogen uh, in Morocco. We have ma mainly identified the heavy mobility uh, and the public transportation for the medium term, uh, but for the long term, we could probably have other applications such as industrial heat and the, and the, 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 the light mobility. 
uh, there have been also some discussion about railway maritime would it be uh, before uh, before uh, before that but that could be defined afterward this is uh, only uh, a start next slide please yeah here also uh, the idea was to to think about uh, what could be the first let's say uh, uh, hydrogen valleys or hydrogen uh, territories in terms of uh, not only about potential but also about infrastructure uh, port uh, uh, industrial chemistry uh, 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 industrial let's say existence of a, of an ecosystem uh, next slide please and last but not least we have uh, last year uh, founded, let's say, the Green Hydrogen Cluster, which, uh, which is around uh, 40 founding members approximately, and we are getting more members uh, that are uh, uh, joining the, this, this journey. And the idea for this cluster is to have a sort of a parallel, a more um, a private sector uh, kind of, uh, of club, uh, as well as, uh, as R&D, research, and, uh, and uh, um, academia. Uh, we have also some universities with us and the idea as i told you is really to have an open uh, 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 framework or virtual and physical as well to discuss uh, those projects that are coming but also to prepare uh, the uh, large-scale projects in terms of uh, 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 training local development local integration etc next slide please this is, uh, you, can, you can go to the website of the Green Hydrogen Cluster, we can have more details and also uh, ideas if you'd like to, or uh, guidelines if you'd like to join. And this is somehow the, um, the, the governance or, uh, or the leadership of the, the cluster. And I, I, I must also say that there are some uh, internal subcommittees or committees that are somehow following the value chain of green uh, uh, hydrogen industry and applications. Uh, uh, and this is also uh, led by some of our founding members that you can find here in the slide, but also on the website if you'd like to have more information. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next, please. Thank you. So now this is the third comer. So we, there is the National Commission on Green Hydrogen Public Institution Orientation Strategic vision of the country there is the green hydrogen cluster which is more industry more uh, endeavors and uh, private uh, private sector endeavors etc and now a third comer which is the green h2a uh, this is a green hydrogen application platform that is based in an industrial site chemical site in the in the in the geoflast for site in the within the ocp premises and uh, we would like it to be a sort of a open scale laboratory uh, as a as a sister platform of what uh, my colleague Ahmed have present, has presented previously, and the idea is really to have uh, uh, the possibility to demonstrate uh, at a pilot scale, at a megawatt scale level, uh, uh, the technologies of power to x When we speak about power to x there are many, many, many technologies. It's a, it's a value chain as a, as, a, as a whole, as I mentioned, and this is really key in order for us to prepare for large-scale projects in the future, to be ready in terms of knowledge and know-how, uh, both on the research point of view, but also from the private sector point of view. And this is really uh, uh, meant to be a sort of a technological backyard uh, for all the private sector partners, both Moroccan, but also internationals, if we, they would like to adapt, to test, and also to validate the technology in a local context, but also to find collaborators, subcontractors that are qualified and or that they would like to qualify them on their technologies locally. Uh, next slide, please. So among the projects that we are promoting in this, uh, uh, the idea, this is now the positioning uh, for the platform uh, in terms of TRL uh, levels, the technology readiness level. As I told you, the idea is really to be the bridge between what is happening in the universities uh, as, a, as, a, as an expertise and know-how, but also be really close to the industry. This is why also we uh, uh, position this platform, physically speaking, inside at the heart of uh, 1,800 hectares of uh, 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 fertilizer uh, uh, industry, one of the biggest, let's say, sites uh, in the world. And this is also the, the um, uh, I am just, uh, I am just disturbed by Anna appearing. That means that I am out of time, sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I will go to the next slide then. Yes, thank you very much. This is one of our, let's say, uh, uh, biggest projects uh, that are uh, starting uh, this year. We will have uh, the construction beginning this year, and uh, the idea is to produce green 
uh, uh, ammonia four tons per day uh, based on uh, 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 multiple technologies uh, two megawatts of PEM electrolysis and two megawatts of alkaline and the idea is also to study to compare the technologies and also to prepare the scale up for the partners I will go uh, quickly afterwards please the, to the next slides uh, I will skip this one please in order to, to stick with time yeah uh, here I would like to speak about what we call uh, uh, in Morocco not the hydrogen valleys but the hydrogen oasis uh, the, uh, if we have uh, to compare the, the the climate here in Morocco so the idea is to give you an, uh, some uh, uh, some hints on what we are promoting as ideas of uh, uh, middle scale or large scale projects we can go really quickly uh, Give please uh, five uh, seconds to each slide. This is Tangiers. We having an air, uh, a harbor there, a port, uh, a very nice wind resource, solar resource as well. This could be the first, let's say, transcontinental hydrogen valley between Europe and uh, and Africa, and also Spain and Morocco. This is really interesting for us. Next slide, please. Casablanca is really a, 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 um, a case study uh, for a multi or a sector coupling this is a, a german word that's now been english side uh, a sector coupling kind of application of green hydrogen between steel industry power production agribusiness uh, storage for in salt cavern and also other chemicals and construction uh, 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 industry next slide please this is Jean Vlasfar, the chemical site uh, where the two million tons arrive to Morocco. There is a big harbor there, and there there is the green hydrogen application platform at the heart of it. We have also steel manufacture uh, not very far, which is also a source of CO2, and also a coal power plant that is also a source of CO2 that we could uh, play with and and uh, demonstrate other uh, production of uh, synthetic fuels and green methanol. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I would speak with uh, about the other one. It's better. This is uh, next slide, please. Again. Yeah, this is Dakhla, and uh, for both Dakhla and Layun uh, that has just been shown, it's a big uh, potential for exports. Those are sites with very nice solar resource, very nice wind resource, uh, very. Uh, enough space and also a very uh, uh, infra in terms of infrastructure, we have a very big harbor. This is the one uh, at your left, uh, one. 0.2 billion euros uh, harbor uh, in Dakhla that is really uh, uh, that will be really well equipped uh, and Dakhla by the way is one of the biggest uh, spots for uh, for surfing so there is a very nice uh, wind resource and uh, then there is a very big potential uh, to produce a very competitive uh, green molecule there uh, uh, would it be hydrogen or ammonia or any other next slide please and that should be my conclusion I'm sorry about that yes thank you Yeah, uh, just to summarize uh, uh, in, in three three re key key points. So uh, Morocco can have really a very nice potential, and this is something that is not uh, uh, new for for everyone and for the friends of Morocco. <clears throat> but uh, what we have been what we have been doing now is that uh, we have pre been preparing the ground in terms of studies, in terms of knowledge, in terms of uh, uh, preparing the uh, uh, some follow up studies. Now now we have. Uh, to see what would be uh, to quantify the the market uh, as are the figures that are announced in Europe or elsewhere real and there is a need for 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 import uh, uh, the regulation aspect is really key and for us also a very big issue is to prepare the land the ground I mean the physical land not only the uh, 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 I mean regulation aspects etc but the physical land in terms of land use uh, and also infrastructure. Uh, master plan uh, and uh, the key driver for us are uh, exports, uh, uh, domestic economy decarbonization and co-localization of PTX industry and innovation within the country. These are the the, the, the main objective for, that we have behind this. Thank, Thank you very you. much uh, um, and uh, I'm sorry for being, uh, for being a bit late. This is okay. It's always a, 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 a challenge to keep a lot of information uh, uh, succinct. I, I realize this, but it's also to keep time for our, our other fellow speakers. But what, what I understand from you, Samir, is really that uh, hydrogen is by no means a, a new story in Morocco. In fact, a lot of the blueprint for what you're doing now has been already developed in the past years that you've been working hard on this. And 
and that there is a, a roadmap towards uh, power to X agenda in 2050, um, and that there's a, a lot of a short term, a mid term, and a long term um, uh, a roadmap there, uh, where many pilot projects are taking place uh, today with Irizen uh, on what the short term market opportunities are, but to also see how these can grow towards uh, uh, the next in the next couple of decades, especially uh, putting uh, into use for uh, a domestic use and, and, and demand on that side, which is which is the most interesting and most important angle, I think, to remember when it comes to uh, Morocco's hydrogen uh, strategy. Now, I'd like to turn straight straight away to our next pillar here because we've we've uh, we've come to um, uh, we come to the next presentation of uh, Mr. Yassine Teba, who is a senior manager at Energy and Utilities in PwC Morocco. Um, Yassine, please uh, let us know a little bit, give us a bit of an assessment on uh, the barriers and opportunities ahead for uh, this national hydrogen market. I think this will complement very well uh, what uh, Samir has, has already mentioned, uh, and specifically some of the main observations of this new report uh, coming out uh, that uh, you may uh, uh, highlight us, us with. If I appear after, one, after uh, your time, you will know why. Thank you. Okay, that's clear. Thank you so much, Anna. I'm really pleased to be here with you today. My turn to thank Res for Africa for the organization of this event and for this beautiful panel of experts gathered for this webcast. In my presentation, we will share with you uh, an illustration of the outcomes and the main recommendations from the study on the green hydrogen market in Morocco, study that we conducted for Res for Africa. As such, we would like to thank Res for Africa for the opportunity offered to us to collaborate on this report and to our colleagues from PwC Italy and to the students of the Bologna Business School for their valuable contributions. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Green alternative fuels uh, as have been seen uh, such, um, such a, uh, the missing link for a functioning net zero economy. Over the past three years, communication about green hydrogen potential has intensified, and we believe that this decade is crucial for the expansion of an international hydrogen market. Currently, the global market is dominated by grey hydrogen, produced from fossil fuels. In the last year, over 120 million tons of grey hydrogen were produced, and this production was consumed mostly in refining and industry and for the production of ammonia. Low carbon production remains very marginal, between one to 4% of the whole production. This trend is expected to reverse due to the cost competitiveness of green hydrogen. Global demand is expected to grow tenfold between now and 2050. And this trend will be driven by new fields of application, such as uh, transport. The Moroccan dynamic is part of this uh, global context. In fact, uh, and uh, we have seen the presentation of uh, Mr. Rashidi, several studies conducted in the last three years by international and national organizations, um, IRENA, MAZEN, or OCP, uh, with IRESEN also, confirmed that Morocco has the potential to take a leading role in the future green hydrogen global market. In line with these studies, Morocco has undertaken several initiatives to facilitate the development of green hydrogen in the country. The main have been presented by Mr. Rashidi. There is uh, the creation of a dedicated organization to coordinate green hydrogen sector, like the National Hydrogen Commission or Green Hydrogen Maroc. Uh, there was promoting international uh, cooperation and launch of uh, initiatives to carry out pilot projects with international partners. Uh, and finally, the development of a national hydrogen strategy, which was uh, uh, very important and uh, uh, for the of the market. Uh, it's in this dynamic that our study fits, with the objective to answer the following question: How Morocco can unlock its market potential and take position in the global green hydrogen market? In other words, what levers to activate? and what barriers to overcome in order to reach the full market potential. We can go to the next slide, please. To address this question, we conducted a high level assessment of the energy sector in Morocco and of the potential of green, uh, green hydrogen. Then we identified Morocco's strengths that could accelerate the development of green hydrogen market in terms of supply, demand, and 
infrastructure. Also, we have identified barriers that Morocco needs to overcome in order to realize its potential. After that, we conducted an international benchmark to take inspiration from other countries' experience and to identify some lessons learned. Finally, in the light of all this work, we have set near short key measures to enable market uptake. As a foreword to our report, we will share with you some illustrative examples of our study's outcomes. First one, it is clear that Morocco has a high potential for green hydrogen production. As you know, to produce green hydrogen, we need renewable energy, renewable electricity, and water. For, this, for, for the first point, the country benefits from natural assets, sun, wind, and land. Uh, the country has a proven track record and a dedicated ecosystem for the de development of the renewable electricity projects. However, this renewable electricity production costs still higher compared to other potential competitor countries. That said, if we consider exporting hydrogen to Europe, the cost of transport will be more advantageous for Morocco and comes to balance this. For the second point, which is water production, the geographical location of Morocco presents a duality. It's a great asset. The country have more than 3,500 of coasts that can benefit from disposition to construct water desalination plants. On the other hand, Morocco is located in a so-called arid zone and the management of water resources is a strategic matter and desalination development should not compete with water supply. In terms of infrastructure, Morocco has a current gas pipeline connecting North Africa to Europe and another one which is uh, planted in Africa and that can be uh, extended to Europe. These pipelines can be converted into hydrogen pipelines, but in order to do that, in order to do that, there is still norms, grid code, and regulation that need to be prepared and implemented to handle this properly. Finally, and what we consider as one of the most valuable assets in Morocco, is that the country benefits from a large scale local operator who is able to stimulate the national demand. We're talking about OCP and uh, uh, the 2 million tons of ammonia of imported per year, as said by my colleague, uh, Mr. Rashidi. However, in this context of developing the national hydrogen market, it is important to take into account uh, that the country's energy sector is undergoing profound changes and the availability, availability of technical resources and financing dedicated to, to green hydrogen need still need to be ensured i think we can go to the next slide please as part of our study we led an international benchmark in order to identify the best practices in other countries our panel included potential competitor countries that have low production costs from renewable energy resources and countries that have made good progress in the, develop, in the development of the sector. By defining strong strategies, planning large-scale investments, implementing regulatory frameworks, and carrying out research and development projects. We have selected three major lessons learned. The full list is presented in our report. First one is that several countries have made their choices between taking advantage of existing networks and injecting hydrogen through mixed injection with natural gas. And those countries have accompanied their decision with the implementation of a network code that set the rules for injection mechanisms. Other countries have decided to invest in new pipelines. And these pipelines are dedicated to hydrogen and designed with the appropriate standards. Second point of our benchmark relates to a trend observed in several countries. Efforts of several countries were directed on stimulating green hydrogen demand by designing financial support mechanisms and allocating funds for green hydrogen. The objective of such an initiative is to close the, to close the uh, price gap between green hydrogen, 
gray hydrogen and other gases and fuels. And at last, another lesson learned is that countries that are developing the market are also developing lab labels that certify the origin of hydrogen and also a guarantee of our, uh, origin systems that will likely to be used to determine if hydrogen can be traded as green or not. We can move to the next slide, please. Our study led to the identification of a set of recommendations and the list of needed actions and actionable uh, recommendations uh, for the development of the green hydrogen Moroccan market. Our key uh, recommendations are classified in three categories. First category is the country's energy strategy recommendations. And this category includes measures that define hydrogen policy in Morocco and its future position compared to other sources of energy. This category focuses mainly on recommendations to be taken into consideration by Moroccan authorities in order to guide the development of the sector and give investors a clear perspective. The second category is about public support recommendations. And this category covers the support, financial one in particular, and gives guidance and regulatory measures needed to reinforce the development of the sector and pursue the market maturity. Third category is governance and implementation recommendations. And this third category examine the different measures that need to be carried out in order to implement green hydrogen policy. These recommendations cover all operational aspects relating to the organization of the market, its governance, relation between stakeholders, operating mechanism and operating models, empowerment, and finally empowerment of research and development uh, pr programs and scale up of uh, uh, pilots. In uh, our report, and I will uh, close my presentation with this, in our report, we came to the conclusion that Morocco has both the assets and the opportunity to use hydrogen or to export it in order to realize its potential and benefits from uh, the first mover advantage morocco needs to take some short near actions first one would be increase supply with access to cheaper renewable electricity and development of desalination projects second one will be plan the needed transport and storage infrastructures. Third one is to stimulate the demand for local use and for exportation. And maybe the last and the most important one, secure the position for green hydrogen in the country's future energy mix and its global energy strategy. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Yassine, for such a, a, a clear conclusion, in fact, uh, and even a pathway forward. Um, so it's, it's, it seems quite clear that uh, Morocco has um, the assets, the opportunities that you say uh, in, in, in country uh, to really, uh, let's say, evaluate and, and use this 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 big uh, strategy on hydrogen going forward um, very interesting I thought were some of the lessons learned from other uh, uh, markets that have already developed their hydrogen or you know, are developing their hydrogen pathways in terms of the choice of the existing networks and new pipelines um, financial support mechanisms that exist to sort of uh, foment and foster um, the takeoff of, of hydrogen and also, of course, this ever importance of labels, uh, making sure that what we are talking about, that we can all agree, uh, something that came back in, I think, uh, Ahmed's presentation when it came to uh, solar PV as well. So, of course, uh, something uh, worth sharing and, and, and expanding towards uh, the green hydrogen as well. So um, I think this is this this really gives us a good wrap up on the second pillar of the power to X and green hydrogen as um, 
um, uh, a strong opportunity for uh, accelerating uh, Morocco's energy transition. Clearly, uh, much is going ahead in that direction. I'd like to turn now for the remaining uh, part of our webinar uh, to uh, the third pillar of potentials, uh, which is the uh, field of urban uh, sustainability and smart cities. And for this, uh, I'd like to bring our first uh, speaker here, uh, Chiara de la Chiesa, who will uh, join us from NLX. Um, she is uh, the head of uh, global retail and strategic marketing at NLX and has spent uh, a great deal of time there uh, really making sure uh, that uh, the, the potentials for um, uh, how cities can become smart, how that contributes to an energy transition strategy overall uh, can really come to fruition. So Chiara, please, the floor is yours. Hello, Anna, and good morning to everyone. Thank you very much uh, for this very, very interesting event. Um, I, will, I, it, I will take 10, maximum 15 minutes of your time to um, show you how CD can contribute to this green energy transition. So, first of all, we all, you can go ahead, please. Okay, so I, I will not spend my, a lot of time on this, but we know that we are living in this green energy transition and the most important message I would like to give you today is that as soon as the, uh, there is an in increasing uh, share of renewables in the power mix, we need to do a second thing, which is electrification of the energy consumption, because that would be a key, a key point in the, um, in the achievement on overall decarbonization targets. So we believe that electricity will be an important winner in this transition because it, it's needed to achieve the targets. If you go ahead, please. In this context, uh, cities have an important, a very important role. So they account for over 70% of worldwide emissions. They consume a large share of overall natural resources. The, and they, the, we will see an increasing share of urbanization in the in the next uh, years. And on top of this, there is an important barrier, which is that municipalities not always have the budget allowed to invest in smart city deployments. Uh, around these four issues that we need to tackle, there are two important streams that we can uh, leverage on to uh, resolve these problems. First is electrification. So there are a number of very interesting uh, consumption that, uh, that um, uh, allow a reduction in OPEX, in cost. So electric mobility, photovoltaic, we've been talking about them today, storage as a, as a nice couple with photovoltaic to keep uh, reducing cost, a, a heat, heat pumps, but also all the digitalization technologies like cloud internet, so things that internet, artificial intelligence can be important levers to focus on. Please. Uh, I represent here today the, the ANEL group. Uh, these, uh, we are a leader in different asset classes that are uh, the foundations of the energy transformation. So we are investing a lot in renewables uh, in, installments. So we are the leader, uh, the world leader with 54 gigawatts installed capacity, but we also are investing a lot in uh, infrastructure and distribution network because we believe that digitalized distribution are key in the in the new um, in the new uh, energy ecosystem and we have 75 million end users attached to our distribution grid on top of them we have the clients so the clients so we have 50 uh, over uh, um, approximately 70 million customers to which we sell commodity electricity and gas and then a few years ago we have created NLX which is the business that is trying to uh, launch services uh, for our customers in order to push uh, the energy transition. If you go ahead, please. 
in particular, we have been created with two strategic objectives. The first one is we know that we will not achieve, so this, if this energy transition will not happen if we don't in, empower final customers in shifting the way they consume energy. So our main objective is to assist all customers, either they are families, their businesses, their city, in a more sustainable and uh, efficient use of energy through services which are based on the electrification of the consumption and on digitalization. And second, we want to create new value. We are inventing new products, new services based on what uh, are the needs of the final customers in order to help them uh, do this, achieve these goals, please. So this is how we are structured. As I said, we cover all the different uh, target cas customer segments. For families, what we uh, what we can give them is uh, photovolta distributed photovoltaic, distributed batteries, services for the home assistants, smart home, uh, energy efficiency solutions. And then we have different, we have four uh, horizontal offering that we offer to all the different segments, which are the commodity, by the way, the electric mobility solutions, but also financial services, and we are starting some telemedicine experiment. For the B2B, so the business segment, you're also offering the same solutions in terms of energy efficiency, distributed energy, but also we are leader in what it, what's called demand response so flexibility solutions we believe that the demand has a very important role in uh, um, getting to an equilibrium of the electricity grid uh, in a cheaper in a cheaper way and then we have the third pillar that i will be focusing on today which is the b2g so these are cities and uh so i would skip directly to the to the next one So we, um, NLX was born through the, the spin-off of all the different services that we were offering to our customers that were not sale of the pure commodity. And among these uh, assets that the NL Group has given us, uh, there was this very important asset page, which are street lights. So street lights, we, are, we, are, we have this important legacy business that's uh, very important because uh, municipalities spend a lot of money each year on, uh, on, on the lighting of the public uh, streets. And the transformation of these street lights into something that can be technologically advanced, so switching from the old technology to LED technology, but also having new I mean, connectors and sensors that allow these street lights to to uh, be adaptive, uh, automatically adaptive to the light that is on the street, so it allows you to, to save money, but also they can be connected. So you can remotely control them from a control room and these allow you to uh, achieve a lot of efficiencies. And then the second business where we are very strong is electric transportation. Um, Electric buses are already uh, a reality in different uh, exam in different countries all over the world. Uh, I will talk to you about a case study later in Chile, uh, but uh, they uh, will be um, from a total cost of ownership standpoint. They are already in the money in some countries, and they will be. Uh, in the money soon in other in other places, and they are a very um, powerful way of uh, reducing costs and reducing air, uh, improving air quality in cities. On top of the e-buses, we also provide chargers. We are not electric buses manufacturers, so we partner with different companies that manufacture them. Uh, so starting from the two businesses, I would like you, if you go please ahead, uh, I would like you to show the entire city ecosystem. So there are different assets and different things in a city that uh, can be um, can be uh, innovated uh, to create a smart city ecosystem. The dotted ones are the three case study I will focus on today, but 
that are the public transportation, the smart lighting, as I told you before, but also the public administration buildings are an important asset to be focused on in order to uh, for energy efficiency solutions. So the electrification of the consumption of these buildings, like hospitals, schools, the PV panels, the batteries, these are very important um, uh, initiatives that can make a lot of difference. Uh, but on top of this, there are also other um, other elements of the city that can improve the the way we all live in our cities: electric mobility, urban safety. The data that that we are all rich of, coming from different sources, can help municipalities uh, uh, improve the the traffic patterns, understand how they work, understand what are the, the the distribution of people across the city in the different moment of of a day and the urban advertising for instance so the lead you know the lead walls with advertising that we see sometimes across the city these can be create a revenue streams for the city that can be then invested in uh, in different um, new projects if you please go ahead, I will go through this uh, three case study and then um, I am done. So electric bus. Santiago del Chile is a best in class example of how a government has decided to implement a transition towards a cleaner fleet of public transport. So Santiago del Chile has already thousands of e-buses on the street and we are the leader there with 100 1500 electric buses the electric buses uh, uh, and do not come by themselves so as a matter of fact we need, you need to switch the way you consider and you treat public transportation but it's a very convenient switch because you have the deposit that are uh, best in class in terms of PV panels integration, LED walls with advertising, you have the chargers to charge the e-buses, you can have smart charging to make sure that you're charging your bus in a, a more efficient way and you give back the electricity to the distribution grid when it's needed and there is all the installation uh, of the electrothermical electroterminals by inset of course the electricity that's provided to these e-buses it's 100 percent green and this is uh, bringing 70 percent operative cost reduction to to the, the city to the municipality of santiago on top of all the benefits that we know in terms of environment and acoustic pollution the second example that I would like to bring you today in the next slide, please, it's the, it's the efficient lighting. So I like to bring this example because this was very, uh, as, a, as a municipality de Lanús in Argentina, and we converted 6,000 uh, public lights in the in this city. And you can see the difference between the consumption of a sodio technology, which was 310 watt, with the LED light, which is just 100 watt. And this is a, a very easy way of reducing the of reducing the, the cost. And with the, the savings that you can get from there, you can install new lights that can bring more security and more improving the lighting conditions of the public spaces. And these uh, luminaries are also uh, suitable for lighting control system, as I said, so you can manage them uh, offline. Finally, the third example is uh, smart buildings. So this is uh, more new also for us, so we are trying to uh, learn more and more about how to improve the retrofitting of existing buildings, but also working with real estate when we build new buildings in order for them to be already state of the art in terms of PV panels, uh, heat pumps, electrification, <laughs> consumption. We have been partnering in Chile uh, with uh, a municipality of Prudencia and we got a fund that is uh, lasting five years for the retrofitting of different buildings. And we have uh, uh, 11 buildings, which are public schools, but also sports center and 
one public uh, building and we are offering for instance 10 pv panels for which of uh, approximately 30 kilowatt each that we are putting on top of the buildings we are uh, using heat pumps for the the hot uh, sanity water but also for the pools hot water which is uh, an important use case for for santiago we are replacing the lighting with LED lighting and we are also selling one electric vehicle and one charger which is the start for a little step to go ahead for the full electrification of their of their fleet and these different solutions bring that immediately savings to the to the municipality so these are just three examples that i wanted to bring you today um, I believe that cities are a very important um, uh, pillar in this, this energy transition and uh, the government and the municipality should <coughs> give the examples on how you can put PV panels uh, and the rest of the different uh, technolo technologies that are already available uh, to improve our, our environment. Um, I'm done, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chiara. Uh, uh, thank you for this this, uh, this very good overview. We have um, some concrete uh, case study examples in, in countries of how the various uh, opportunities in the space of lighting, in mobility, um, in, in buildings, of course, uh, um, there, there can be some very interesting smart city solutions there. I note uh, the examples of, of uh, electric transportation in, in, in Chile and on the public mobility side, which is, of course, a tremendous area um, of, uh, uh, of a low-hanging fruit. Uh, the Providencia Municipality in Chile as well, and uh, the lighting uh, with, uh, in, in, in Argentina, of course. So I, I think this illustrates your point very nicely, how cities have become an energy actor in and of itself that can really uh, gather further momentum in transitions overall, but especially uh, as more at the, at, the, at the micro, not so micro actually, because some cities are of course uh, tremendously and huge, but at, at their own level and be actors of change within that as well. And I think uh, Analex is doing uh, clearly some 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 very um, uh, upfront uh, uh, cross-cutting work here. So thank you, Chiara, for this. And I think thank this will. Uh, nicely complemented by uh, our last speakers, um, Mr. Ahmed Bouzid and Ms. Selma Absi, who are working uh, at the CIA, the Société d'Investissement Energétique in, in Morocco, uh, really um, doing perhaps also some very similar uh, uh, concrete examples of where in Morocco some energy efficiency uh, solutions and investments uh, are making the difference uh, when it comes to uh, the uh, energy footprint, let's say, of uh, cities uh, at, in, in, in the country itself. So I'd like to uh, invite uh, Ahmed and Selma to take the floor uh, for our last presentation of today um, before we wrap up. Thank you. Ahmed, uh, Mr. Bouzid, is this working for you? I see you are connected, but maybe uh, having a bit of difficulty to switch to your presentation. Do let us know. Um, hi, Perfect. everyone. We can um, see you. Just waiting for Selma to start. Selma, are you available? I am. Can you hear me? Uh, we can't hear you clearly. Yes, Selma, it seems your sound is quite low. But we can hear you very well, Ahmed. Although now I think you are on mute, but we can hear you. Uh, now you are muted, but we can we could hear you very well before. Vous m'entendez pas? Maintenant, oui. Merci, Selma. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, so you can hear me now? <laughs> yes. Please go ahead. We're waiting for you. Okay. Thank you. So I was saying, good morning, everyone. Uh, I wanted to start by thanking the organizers for the invitation to this quality event. Uh, we are very happy to be a part of it. Uh, we will do our best to meet the time limit. And uh, I will start with a brief presentation of SIE before uh, letting Ahmed go into the details of the uh, achievements carried out by uh, us for sustainable cities. So um, 
Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. SIE has been part of the Moroccan energy ecosystem since 2010. Um, it has evolved from an investment role to become today the first African state-owned energy service company, also known as Super Esco. So we work mainly with the public sector, uh, with clients in the public sector to support them in the preparation, execution and monitoring of their energy efficiency projects. Um, we work under the supervision of the Ministry of Energy Transition and Sustainable Development, uh, playing a role of intermediary and facilitator <clears throat> for the public administration. And we also create intersectoral partnerships between stakeholders. So the Super ESCO concentrates its action on two sectors, which are the public buildings to strengthen the exemplarity of the state and also the public lighting. But we also cover um, other sectors like in the industry and uh, sustainable mobility. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so we develop our missions to carry out uh, energy efficiency studies, audits. We also provide a wide range of energy solutions and services in line with the international standards to enable the public administration and private sector companies to reduce their energy consumption. Um, we also support private ESCOs and SMEs, and we also ensure guaranteed results and uh, objective evaluations through the production of reports, uh, monitoring, measures and uh, verification, etc. Um, next, please. Regarding the financing of our projects, um, several methods can be considered. So either the client can finance its project if uh, he has the means to, otherwise, the ESCO can take care of the funding. Um, another alternative is the use of a third party, which can be a private bank or uh, an international financing institution. Um, next, please. So here I'm going to present the, our modes of intervention. So after a study of the barriers and specificities of the Moroccan market, we designed uh, tailor-made models adap uh, adapted to local needs. So each model has been uh, has its own business model, and uh, we have a role to play in each one of them. So the first one is the project management assistant assistance, where we support our client in the preparation, the structuring, and the implementation of uh, the energy efficiency project. Uh, we have the steering role here, which means that we do not get involved in the works, but we guarantee the compliance of the execution of these works. Um, concerning this service, we have two types of contracts, either an engineering procurement uh, construction and installation contract, or the energy performance contract. The second one is the delegated project contracting. So here the client uh, delegates the project management to the super ESCO, uh, where we take the responsibility for all the activities um, falling under the project management. Um, such as the definition of the needs, the contractualization, and the management of uh, all the operations. Um, basically, the services rendered are the same as for the project management assistance, except that this time it's under the delegated project uh, contracting, uh, which allows us basically to act as an intermediary with the suppliers and to have the capacity to contractually engage with the, the client uh, by delegation. So, uh, next please. Thank you. So finally, the third mode of intervention is the what we call the ESCO mode. So this service is com uh, comparable to that of the DMP, except that it is supplemented by the provision of the necessary financing for the realization of the investments. Uh, here, the super ESCO concludes a performance contract with the clients, and we engage in the design, the financing, the implementation, and the maintenance of the of the project uh, where we can also outsource the delivery of uh, services to private companies um, i just wanted to put an emphasis here on the energy performance contract uh, because it is an innovative uh, market instrument um, because beyond the implementation of energy performance measures it is a financial tool that enables better risk management and uh, it also allows the client to benefit from the know-how and expertise provided by uh, an ESCO, uh, which we will see in the case studies. Um, next, please. 
Um, so finally, I just wanted to briefly uh, sum up the key elements of the energy performance contract. So uh, it allows it um, in this um, in these contracts, the ESCO is committed to improving the energy performance of the facility. Uh, the ESCO here is also the risk taker because the contract is structured in a way uh, where the compensation of the ESCO is based on demonstrated performance. And um, so it is fully committed to the project. Uh, we also have uh, a agreed method for measuring and verifying energy savings during the entire duration of the contract. And uh, uh, I mean, as we saw in the different, fi the different financing options, the EPC agreement allows the investment to be carried out either by the ESCO or a third party financier. So now I will let, give the virtual floor to Ahmed to share some of the projects carried out by SIE in different sectors. Thank you, Salma. Thank you, Salma. Um, well, I, I, first I would like to add that all the scheme that Salma has presented are 100% fitting to the Moroccan situation because um, they are following uh, the vision of creating a market. We decided at SIE to change to a bottom-up way of working. Um, I would like you, I, I would ask your help, Anna, five minutes before um, time's ending um, to tell me because I would like to share some lessons learned. Um, That's why I'm going to move a little bit fast. Um, next, please. I will, try, I will first of all start with some project, some business models. Uh, the first one is the, the business model for street lighting. Uh, Marrakesh, I know, I think everyone knows the city, and uh, we, the city with almost uh, 61 light, 61,000 lighting points, with, um, I mean, for the project, an availability rate of uh, 75, 70% of the, of, of the street lighting equipment. Um, the business model is based on a performance-based contract. Um, uh, we've been able to raise uh, something like 250 million investment on private investment. And this project today finally is generating more than 50,000 day of work uh, annually. And um, the savings are, um, the guaranteed saving are 60% in the contract, but we can achieve something like 65 and sometimes this to enter 85%. Uh, this is definitely not, um, I'm not arguing as a commercial, um, I'm going to say 85%, I will definitely talk not only about LEDs, but also about this kind of, um, of non-technical losses where some, well, people are simply stealing electricity from the, uh, from the um, street lighting equipment. Um, this project uh, hired uh, directly more than 200 people living in the city, of course. And this, we achieved um, um, a bankability of this project by um, commercial banks, which is very important. We are not talking anymore about development bank. We are not talking anymore about sovereign funds and certainly not about, um, how can I say, the state warranty. So uh, next, please. Um, we created um, a joint venture between municipality and the private sector. Um, Selma mentioned already that we uh, can finance this, those projects with, with banks, investors, and with, um, with, the, with the, the equity of the clients. Um, this is not an older situation, but, an, uh, but we can combine all the solution in order to to achieve the, the cheapest or to get the cheapest money for the project. Meaning, um, in fact, if, if when, when the project is small, we are more working with investors and when the project is with, it's really big, so the, the need of the debt will be bigger and that's why we'll be working with banks. And of course, the equity um, is very important in order to get more interesting um, debt. Um, we, for example, we, make the, we made the proposal to the municipality to invest in the project 
in terms of equity. And we gave an IRR of 7% for every dirhams invested by the municipality in the SPV, which, made, which has made the project extremely more bankable for everyone. And now the project is simply working perfectly. Um, and the municipality is extremely happy because they got um, an availability rate then for more than 95%. Next, please. Next, okay. So, um, information system. Uh, I, once again, I would like to keep the time for the lesson learned. Well, that, that, something that everyone learn, knows. Um, um, information system, we, are, we got now complaint management system, intervention management system, asset management system, fleet management system, electronic document managing system, using IP MVP um, protocols, communication system between the field and the teams, all um, equipment that um, has been for many years uh, uh, a bonus to for every municipality. But now this is simply the tool, the daily tool of the municipality. Next, please. Um, once again, money, the monitoring system, we got um, the, the consumption displaying every 15 Every, every 15 minutes, so we know if there is any illegal plugging to the network and we did all something we can control. We achieved more than 2 million euro savings only through the monitoring systems. Uh, next, please. Okay, um, of course, we are uh, monitoring all the progress of the works. We are monitoring the extension um, because I mean, we, we are working on a performance-based contract with a situation of reference. But um, in fact, the city is getting bigger. So every time we become an extension, this the extension will um, be monitored uh, also and will respond to the same requirement as the main project. We are also monitoring um, the fight against the fraud. We are monitoring the availability of the luminaries and of course the energy savings because it's the base of the payback. Uh, once again, uh, next please. Okay. Well, in red, the volume consumed for the project. Um, and right now, this is the, the final result in 2021. It's not estimated, it's, in, it's a final result. So we achieved more than 60% um, savings. And of course, we are including right now also the consumption of the, um, the extension of the city and the consumption uh, of out of service lighting points has mainly disappeared. And now we are very proud of this result. Next, please. Okay, um, we strongly believe that street lighting is the absolutely best. I would say backbone of uh, sustainable development because it's it's easy and in fact it is the best um, training to public uh, private partnerships and uh, we can extend street lighting to everything to 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 waste of energy we can extend it to um, energy efficiency in building but we can but once the the PPP model is accepted by the municipality. We can definitely move very quickly also to e-mobility. And this is what we made also in Marrakesh with the first uh, e-buses in Morocco. Next, please. Ahmed, I have to ask you to wrap up your uh, presentation. Oh, you already here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, next please. Um, in buildings, um, we created also a business model dedicated to buildings. We started with Moss because the, 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 the technical and financial challenge was extremely easy. A mosque is working seven days a week, 365 days a year with the exactly same uh, energy consumption. So this is the reason. And uh, I mean, the, we've been changing bulbs, we've been putting some solar water heaters and I mean it's a very the technical uh, there is no technical issue I would say and this is why we started with business. 
We started with one mask, uh, and now we are achieving more than 3,000 masks a year. And this model is now very replicated to schools. This is, um, once again, a business model that uh, works perfectly. Uh, next, please. Well, um, now we even in public building we, uh, we introduce the super, super, supervision and energy management system and all the masks in the country. Um, okay, next please. Um, super, there's uh, simply some sort of supervision stream where we are monitoring the active power and the current and the voltage. Next please. Okay. Um, the load curve is very important because now we know when we know that there are times where the mosque should not consume anything, and now we can um, work directly with the mosque if there is any extra consumption. Next, please. Oh, so uh, for ending, I really uh, I would like to, to to share with you some some lesson we learned. The, the first one is really that the sustainable development should be carried by the market. Um, so it's, uh, in fact, when uh, when we found that there is a city consuming, um, when when we find a building with over fifty five percent energy consumption during the night, or a city uh, with a with a fraud of twenty percent of the whole consumption, um, if we think business, we may be very happy with this fact because it makes the profitability extremely higher, and this is why. Um, it's, 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 it's comparable with striking oil without a combustion machine. When you got when you got a so huge potential without an issue, without without making business with this with this potential. The second one is it's very important to, to increase the awareness, but it's not the absolutely most important part because we need first of all to create the business models. Um, we need first of all to create this business model, and then the absolutely best awareness is or the best training is definitely this um the, sol the, sol the solution the business solution itself then we will simply increase the awareness by making uh, making some publicity to the solution um we we need to solve barriers because there is so many so, so many fantastic technologies that we cannot get and we're always asking ourselves why it does it doesn't happen there is um there is not only one text, legal text that governs everything, but dozens of laws and regulation that should be adopted to make it more easy. The regulatory framework should, for example, allow public companies to sign or to allow uh, municipalities to sign long-term service contracts. They also have to uh, the offer cannot be uh, cannot be selected by the lowest bidder. The company public companies. What? Thank you, Ahmed. I'm gonna have. I'm afraid I'm gonna have to uh, cut your uh, the presentation short because we're already sort of uh, 15 minutes over time, and uh, we uh, need to uh, end our project, uh, pro our program here. But I thank you very much for 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 uh, this. Fortunately, didn't cut anybody before. Thank you. Well, we're trying to uh, keep in touch with the time uh, in this in this space. I know it's a very difficult exercise to do uh, because we have so much uh, to uh, talk about. But towards the end of the presentation, as we've arrived here uh, at the end, uh, we uh, really do thank everyone for uh, sticking with us also until the end here, uh, uh, as we've gone a bit over time. And uh, I'd like to. Uh, Thank in particular all of our speakers, all of our experts that have joined us. And in fact, uh, really the, the, the key message here is clear. We have uh, this accelerated uh, uh, option and, and, and real momentum gathering on the energy transition in Morocco. Much has been achieved, much more can be achieved in that direction. There's three concrete uh, pillars of activities of, of market potential that lie ahead with us within the solar energy field that uh, our three speakers have uh, highlighted, uh, notably in the small scale uh, solar PV space. We've looked at green hydrogen and the power to X uh, technologies and a range of, of, of vast horizon uh, of, of work being done there by Morocco and much more to take place. And we've looked at smart cities and sustainable uh, urbanization uh, with some very concrete and very uh, exciting pilot projects and examples taking place, uh, not just uh, in uh, Latin America, uh, but also in Morocco itself, uh, as was just shown by our colleagues in CA. So I'd like to end here. Thank you very much for uh, uh, joining us, sticking through with us.
us until uh, the end. Uh, the presentations will be made available uh, uh, via a link that will be sent to all participants so that you will be able to look more in depth uh, on this uh, element. Uh, the the uh, reports that we've uh, mentioned here today on small scale PV and on green hydrogen will be made available as well. You will receive a communication about this shortly. And I thank you again uh, for uh, sticking with us, looking at uh, the case of Morocco in this year, where also Risk for Africa will celebrate its uh, 10 year anniversary. Thank you so much and hope to meet in person shortly in Morocco. Thank you and have a very good afternoon. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Thank you very much to all.